Hello everyone, welcome to Tactica Imperialis and to today's video. Today is episode 98 of Adeptus Podcastus. The next time this show is on my channel, it's episode 100. That's, that's a prospect. But we're not there yet and we've got plenty to discuss. So joining me as always is Remlays from 40k Theories. Hello everyone. And our special guest this week is someone who we have had requested very often in recent times in the comments and someone who Rem and I have worked with very, very recently. Ladies, gentlemen, Xenos of all ages and everything in between, I give you Voldemort. Oh, hello, 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 hello. <laughs> yes, uh, we got him, if you like. Um, you've been very, very requested by our comments. I've been asking a lot of last few episodes to get you on the show. So welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me here. You're welcome. Uh, Absolutely no problem. I I have to ask, is I, I assumed when I heard your first video that that was just a narrator voice. I don't know if it is a narrator voice or that's how you actually sound in normal conversation. I'm not going to assume either way. I just wondered. It, it's cutting out every now and again, I'm afraid. So um, I, I presume... Okay, it was just 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 a, a comment on that. I didn't know. I sort of assumed that that was a narrator voice rather than an all-the-time on-air voice or that was a normal working voice it's fine either way i, I was just curious oh, uh, it, 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 it's know. more of my phone voice which yes i i do when i'm on air um obviously i can be a little bit more energetic but um well yes i'm a little bit nervous i do apologize honestly you have well you we feel you have no reason to be um i think your subs actually are more than mine um so if anything i'm the kid in the room I think certainly by age, I'm the kid in the room. Um, so, that's... Well, yes, but number, numbers don't count for everything. Size matters not and all that, you know, yoga yeah, lines. True, 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 true. Right, uh, we have a lot to cover because, as you are well aware, we did episode 97 prior to the big one of 40,000 preview. And I got absolutely royally mugged off because I was sending the whole episode saying, oh, they'll not do 9th edition. They need to get everything in order first. For Psychic Awakening, 9th edition. Just drop 9th edition right in my face. It's like, okay, great. Thanks, G-Dubs. But yeah, we I, have got I, a lot to discuss. I think we just need to point out that Wargamer Girl was scarily accurate of her predictions. Like, I think she must be psychic. Either mm. psychic or has an inside source. One of the two. Possibly both. <coughs> Who knows? Or has just been watching the entire thing for a long time and uh, had some really good reactions based on what she knew. It's, it's certainly possible. I think, possible. to be fair, a lot of people were predicting ninth um, prior to this preview. <laughs> I think I was probably in the minority in saying it was more likely to be a, a, a big drop before ninth and then ninth was going to come later. So I was probably the minority opinion at this point. Um, and I proved to be wrong, so that's fine. Um, but we got a lot, obviously, on the show itself, and we've had plenty in the intervening couple of weeks, uh, both models, law, and rules. Plenty to get through. Mm. So I guess the question is, where do we start? Any preferences, Ram? Um, Wherever you'd like. What sir. was it that recently dropped... Um, well... Let's, just, let's, let's drop, drop, start off with the um, the new art that they've showcased for 9th edition, which actually looks really nice, actually. Mm, I know that that has won the hearts of Twitter. Um, some the of Gungus. The artwork, um, with like, gun fungus or something. Uh, I know that that's a meme that's going around at the moment. Uh, but there is some really good you stuff. Love the Gungus. Um, <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. Uh, but yeah, the artwork of Abaddon and Gilliman, where Gilliman's doing his best Sanguinius impression, um, is quite nice. Um, and it's it was nice of them to point out uh, like the artwork of like Terra, where they had this huge statue of the Emperor and the Pilgrims underneath. And sort of saying, at a glance, it looks great. But then you look again and you realize, actually, does that statue look as benevolent as you think? And do those Pilgrims look happy to be here? It was, it was quite interesting. Oh, I when you look again... I was more surprised that that statue, considering it's supposed to be a statue of the Emperor, looks an awful lot like Gilliman. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, no, I haven't actually had much time to look at... Well, 
when it comes to new art, I kind of like to sit back and really look at it. And I've got to admit, I've been so busy this week that I haven't actually seen the art drops yet. I've seen them obviously in small screen, um, but I'm really, really looking forward to uh, later on or tomorrow being able to really just absorb everything that's going on because it's uh, it's been going so fast as you say mm -hmm. but new art as we all know doing what we do it's uh, it's so needed it's so so needed people think there's a huge amount there actually isn't really if you break it down into individual groups etc when either myself rem or anybody else are trying to put a video together i think we're all pretty much sick and tired of seeing exactly the same stock art i just think they should have a lot lot more and it's wonderful that they're starting to bring some out no, and that was a bit no, no, no. I do that's a fair point you, um I know when I go looking for artwork, um, I actually try and stay away from doing official GW arts in my law videos because I like to give credit to other artists and showcase their work uh, where I can. And it's also much easier to accredit to artists on like deviant art than it is to accredit to a GW artist because sometimes they don't tell you who did what. Um, but it is really absolutely quality artwork. And the one I'm looking at at the moment is the one of, I think it's the Blood Angels. And it's it, it's hard to describe. I'll, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat in case people can't uh, remember which one I'm talking about. But it's a really, really interesting image that sort of plays up sort of the... I don't want to say the nobility of the Blood Angels, but also completely doesn't. Because uh, it's such a dark set of tones. Everything looks like it's on fire in the background. Nobody looks happy to be there. Um... Yeah, that's, that's the Blood Angels, yeah. I like they're actually using the, um, you see with the chapter banners, uh, they're the ones that are still being used from like, you know, from, the, from well, from 1.5 edition. Because like um, the main one um, that's being shown, I think that was actually on the uh, the old War Gear book from uh, second edition. Yeah, I see so, what you mean. Actually, yeah, it might be. Some of these banners... So well, oh, yes. Uh, are you talking about the, sort of like the third one from the left? Yeah. Yeah, that's the fella. Oh, that brings back some memories, doesn't it? I've got it to is, admit, uh, this, I'm just looking at this image for the very first time, so I do apologise. I'm a bit staggered. On the right-hand side, doesn't he look at almost a bit word for bearer in feel? <laughs> um, like, just I don't even know it, what cetera, sort of Space but... Marine that is, because that staff doesn't look like any Space Marine war gear I know. I, like, if I had a guess, I'd say he was a chaplain. Yeah, I, but, I would have said it was a crozier sort of variant as well, Rem. Yeah, uh, yeah probably. The, I, don't know if the, I don't know if the armor's black and... Uh, it looks black, it's, but it could be the lighting in fairness. Mm. It it could very much be the lighting, yeah. hard to say. And yeah, it's it's just a really interesting piece of work. And it's nice actually to see at the bottom left, you've got that yellow and black yep. striped chainsaw. That's a throwback. That's a proper throwback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did Iron Warriors the other day. Ooh, lovely. You've got to admit, that yellow and black, <laughs> it, it just looks great, doesn't it? Come on, it's like a massive, angry bumblebee. And yeah, you can... ah, anyway, sorry, I haven't had a lot of sleep, so I do apologise. I can sympathise, don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Insomnia, hey, yay. Uh, spinal issues, yay. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> mm. oh, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's right. Not fun. No. Not fun. Um, no. Probably the area that all three of us are strongest would be to discuss Dawn of Fire, uh, which is, in case people are not sure on the name, the basically the Indomitus Crusades answer to the Horus Heresy and the Beast Arises yeah. series. It's it's that style of series. It's a big series mm. with a lot of writers, um, but they've changed it up a little bit. I think they said that Guy Haley was chief writer and Nick Kine was doing a lot of editorial oversight. Um, so they've slightly yeah. tweaked the heresy formula to try and keep it a bit more... Is consistent the right word? Or so that they don't contradict each other, probably the best way of putting it. Oh, I bloody... Cohesive. I, yeah. <laughs> and I really hope they don't contradict um, each other, considering that we, the amount of contradictions we've already had with the Siege of Terror novels already. Um, 
Um, you know, so, some of... Yeah, I haven't read all of them, unfortunately. I uh, I got to a stage where I just thought, oh, crumbs. You know what it's like when you first start making videos? You, you really don't know anything. And I'm such a computer idiot as well. I haven't had much time. And then after that, when I was uh, hanging around at the club, once well, obviously before the event, and um, someone said, oh, yeah, uh, the Siege of Terror is completely changing. I've just read the books. Ha, ha, ha. Obviously, you know, I, I almost had a stroke. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've, I've heard that a lot has changed. I've still got to get into them a bit more and yeah it's one of those things where is you think that well i did six to eight months ago you think that well they're not going to change the actual story it'll be fine i can just do my little dances etc it'll be okay to find out that no they're actually retrofitting quite a bit um well it feels that way anyway i, I, I wouldn't um, so, necessarily ooh, say that again. they're retroactively changing a lot of the siege to i think the I think the best way to explain it is that they're uh, expanding upon it in the way because previously, like mm. it, all, all we had was very bare bones in regards to the siege of terror. I think literally the only thing we had in detail was the emperor's fight with Horus. And that was the only thing we had in detail. Yeah, like you could sum up the siege of terror on a piece of A six with some bullet points. Like there was a big invasion. The Iron Warriors were in charge. Angron probably got to the gate first, except maybe he didn't. Sanguinius had a massive fight with Commander and broke his back. Dawn turned up on a flying fortress, which then crashed. The Emperor's children ran off to smash the Administratum, and that's why all spe humans hate space marines. There was a big showdown between Sanguinius and Horus. Sanguinius lost. Then the Emperor fought Horus. The Emperor won. Period. Oh, you romantic, you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that before the Siege series, or certainly before the Heresy really got going, that was the Siege in bullet points. And the, <gasps> half that stuff with the flying fortress, that's new. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know what you mean, but I mean, for me, it was the little things, obviously, being a bit of a flappy, flappy fan, that the fact that he was originally, as far as I remember, obviously, I'm always going to look stupid compared to you guys, um, Sanguinius stared down at Angron, and the two of them pretty much decided not to go for it, but I hear in the new one, uh, again, I still not read it, uh, Sanguinius sallies out, gets his ass kicked a bit, and then has to run away clucking a bit, um, is that correct, or is someone just there was a really scene where basically badly? Sanguinius went to reinforce one of the walls, and the wall itself gets breached, and Sanguinius does end up getting well, be up a little bit, but he ends up you know winning his little fight in the end, but ends up having to recover because he ends up having visions about well visions from ooh. Perturabo's point of view. It's like oh oh I, I, I can see this oh oh my powers are growing <laughs> and oh no the blood ah damn it <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> If that doesn't sum up the Blood Angels in oh. one sentence. <laughs> Fair enough. I see what you mean. But obviously I'm, I'm waiting yeah. for that. We'll get back to the Blood Angels later uh, because I finished off Mephiston City of Light. Uh, so we'll get back to that one, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, I know what you mean. But going back to Dawn of Fire, uh, essentially this is them doing the Indomitus Crusade properly. Like, the first book is, uh, they're saying it takes place of a quarter sound, which yeah. I think I remember right, was the first naval engagement, like the first proper battle of the Indomitus Crusade, where basically one fleet master went to kill him and said, let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go. Fine. Smash. I, I, I really hope it's not just a fleet battle based book, because I'm, pr I'm probably in a minority here, but I just find naval battles in 4K so boring. Like, they're good for a chapter, maybe <laughs> like, a, a with, sequence. With Solar War, for example, I mean, I, I understand yeah. the importance that the naval battles, you know, were. I mean, no one's denying that they were important for the, you know, the whole narrative and, and the story point. But it, it was just so dull to read overall. I mean, the only part of that naval battle I actually enjoyed, you know, reading about was when, you know, um, Abaddon and, you know, the Justaran, you know, no, not Abaddon, um... No, it was Abaddon, yeah. Abaddon and the Just Aaron Moore and the... Oh, sorry. Is my Discord cutting out? Uh, yeah, but the best part was silence. <laughs> Bugger. <laughs> um, but yeah, the best part was um, when you had Abaddon and the Just Aaron on the um, the White Scars ship. They go to the bridge, there's no one there, then all of a sudden, fucking White Scars crash a fucking Cestus Ram into the bridge. What is it with the White Scars of setting bait on their own ships? That's the second time they've done it. I mean, if it works. Uh, exactly. It's not broken. It didn't work, though. Vortarian escaped. <laughs> ah, details, as people say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. 
Um, but yeah, we don't know much about Dawn of Fire yet, aside from the fact they've made it clear this is not just going to be a Space Marine smash fest. Um, we're going to be seeing events that involve uh, naval commanders, uh, guardsmen, even I think there's going to be bits and bobs that are going to show regular citizens as well. So it isn't just going to be a Space Marine smash a um, as the or a Primaris yeah. glory circle. A, a, or a glory circle, it, okay. That's such a. I didn't. I had a, a way that sentence was going, and I lost my train of thought. All right, I lost my train of thought. I think, I think, the, correct, I think the correct term was circle jerk. <laughs> I lost my sentence halfway through. All right, fine. <laughs> Never mind. On we go. Um, but yes, uh, Guy Haley's writing it, which makes me think that. Well, I, w I assumed it was going to be the follow up to Plague War. I was wrong because this is going back in time. Uh, but yeah, it seems like Guy Haley's still got pseudo control over Gilliman. I mean, on one side, I'm really excited. We're going to see more of the actual uh, setting uh, really flushed out. We're going to see it from lots of different perspectives. That's really exciting to me. I mean, like, really exciting to me. Um, the fact that it's only going to be Bobby G hanging around is a... Uh, you, you can see why, though. Um, one of those things. Again, I have no dislike of him. It's just... Um, when you, I, I feel that he's almost like one record. When you hear that one record for about three months on a trot, which my brother used to do to me, one damn record, you really want to scratch it. <laughs> so I just wish that they'd... I, I really thought at the beginning of ninth they would move it forward by bringing out, say, like one Primark per edition, you know, every two or three years, and we would see something completely new and a new dynamic, and they'd build up to a, a civil war, and what we're seeing instead is, you know, potentially four years of books about Robert. And that, that's wonderful. Um, what, y yummy. Mm -hmm. I, I, see, I see your argument there. Um, personally, I would, have, I would advocate for keep as many Primarchs away as is humanly possible. Like, as many as you can should stay away and stay dead. But... Yeah, but the Pandora's box is open. That, that 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 box is open. It now. is. And also, you couldn't say that when you've got so many demon primarchs. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. and otherwise, it's a case of, well, they've got the big shiny balloon. Where's okay. mine? Then the other counter I was going to make is, that means that Imperium and Chaos get all the shiny toys for the next 30 years. Whereas 9th edition, the big model that they're opening up with, and the big range release, is the Necrons and the Silent King. So, for once... It's not just all about the Space Marines because we're pushing another faction, another species, which is a good change. And I think putting a Primarch out would really overshadow that because it suddenly is like, wait, we've got a Primarch back? Oh my God, Primarch, 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 Primarch. It would overshadow anything else. Hmm. Although I see what you mean, my argument is generally, why not both? And I, I get the feeling, I, get, I don't know why, I have nothing to base it on but I get the feeling that they're going to drop something nearer or on the day anyway. But again, I, I'm probably wrong. We'll see, I suppose. Um, I think... Mm. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see another Demon Primarch back. I, I think Demon Fulgrim would be an yeah. amazing model to see if they ever do it. Um, They'll probably do Angron next to in fairness. Demon Angron, well, yeah. Um, and we still don't have mm -hmm. a clue what Demon Pert looks like, so that could go flipping anywhere. Um, no. Nope. Yeah, it's... I, mm. I personally think that too much Primarch saturation would end up just meaning that, oh, you play Imperium, oh, what's your army? Seven Primarchs. Okay, maybe not Imperium. Oh, you play Chaos, what's your army? Seven Primarchs. How? Because I can. Great. What, what name characters have you got? Um, uh, Seven Primarchs. Uh, yeah. Versus yeah, it's, it's, oh, we got we have Gazkul. It's one Lord of War who fits on a base small that can go toe to toe with the weakest Primarch the Imperium will ever have in combat, pretty much. Um, and oh, what have you, what have you got, Tau? Nothing. Necrons. Oh, we have the Silent King. That's good. You got one dude. Good. It, it would just feel exceptionally unfair unless you could Primarch tier some characters without having to completely break the law to do it or introduce Primarch tier characters for species that really shouldn't have them. Yeah, I, I see what you mean again, but we're still sat with uh, the rest of us having nothing, and uh, say Bobby G's boys, and of course uh, Autarian's lads, 
and uh, of course, uh, you know, big old flappy flap one eye, the Cyclops running around. So the ball's in there. Uh, and my, my perspective would be, yes, I agree with you. Either have none or have more. And just because there are, it's easy to do a Primark doesn't mean that they couldn't do, say, something like a proper cane, a uh, Kayla Mincha. There's no reason why they couldn't buff up the... Uh, you know, the incarn, and there's no reason why something else couldn't come out. I'm not really a preclusive person, more of an inclusive. It's because of, well, it, it, oh, if no, the balloons I are up, let's, let's get more balloons in the air. Although I do see what you mean, but I'm more of a narrative player. So I just kind of chortle when I see multiple people in tournaments using um, Primarchs. And I, I just find it quite hilarious because it's not my concern. Um, so I, I, but I do see what you mean. And um, yeah, that, that could be a major problem, escalation. But we know escalations occurred think, already. Yeah, I, I, I do get it. And I think it would be nice to see some more of the Primarchs back in model form. Uh, even if they didn't have rules and they were purely collector's items, that would be an interesting concept. I think it would just be because, oh, right. So we're putting out for this game, this, this new edition, we're going to have the Lion versus the Silent King. Right, who's going to... I don't want to say care because it seems too harsh, but this is why I was surprised when <laughs> Psych Awakening 9 was sort of revealed as early as it was. It now makes sense in the context of 9th edition because revealing Illuminor Cezeras meant that no one cared, minus the people who were going to buy him anyway, about the Fabius Bio miniature. And even less people, were, apart from the Mechanicus players, were as fussed for Engine War. You put too many things out at once, it's, it would risk damaging one or both of them in terms of fan awareness and also in sales, which if you're G-dubs, that matters. Um, and also, who do you hype up? So it's like, why would you reveal a brand new faction and then reveal another brand new faction before that first faction has come out? The hype train cannot compute that. And when you've got Sigmar and 40k running in parallel with each other and they both need time... It, it would be nice. I just think it would be impractical to do. I don't know. I feel it would be impractical. No, I, I absolutely agree with you uh, up to 99%. My other 1% says, um, although I, again, absolutely agree with you, it's now becoming much larger, much more broad. They're hoping to have Eisenstein, or Eisenhorn out uh, what, in a year or two maximum. We're going to see a lot more, and we we have got a lot more people who are now actually just searching on, say, uh, Reddit for for law i think it's becoming much much larger so although i absolutely agree with you if it was exactly the same catchment zone of people releasing it like that would be insane it would be silly especially as we know that their purchasing model is um purchase you know impulse buying but they, 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 seem, they don't seem to be getting a lot right in some regards if you look at say the impulser it was you know we, 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 they've got a model of impulsing buying impulse buying but then after that they'll make you wait five months for the damn model which is too long whereas yeah, on the other hand certainly there were some like yeah that. exactly whereas i think okay well obviously the the event has thrown everything off but i think people like us who are sitting around saying no no they could possibly release more than one bigger model a year are soon going to be going oh my god it's like a juggernaut because the individual groups will be larger I mean, to be fair the, yeah I mean, to be fair, like even like from since we started this podcast, like that was in the days of it was sort of that was before eighth edition was a thing. We started this show, um, I think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was back in seventh edition, and we were still in the era of one big release a month. I I remember the days when fantasy would go three months without seeing a model, and forty k you could go two months or more quite easily. I presume fantasy, fantasy would go more like six months without seeing a model now, I think. Oh, try the 90s. You could wait years without a model. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean like an army. I mean, the entire game could go months without a model. Like the entire right. game wouldn't be touched for months. And now it's like, mm. wait, so they haven't touched Sigma in three weeks? Where is the Sigma? <laughs> <laughs> the, the GW release train has really gone. Uh, the, the juggernaut you speak of has already rolled out the station, and we ain't stopping the train. So I do see where you're going with it, and I think I'm certainly would not be surprised to look back at episode 198 and say, "Yeah, I was completely wrong here." Oh. I wouldn't be shocked. But either way, we're all going to enjoy it. So it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Sorry, Ram. Sorry. I, I think I cut out. <laughs> Fair enough. Just, yeah, sorry. Talked a lot. Um, right, where do we go next? Um, probably something logistical. Um, so, speaking of books, your codices and Psychic Awakening are all valid for 9th edition, as I'm sure you know, which is a plumb and good thing. It yeah. is. Oh, come on, that's going to be for about three months until... Yes, they are. But look at the wonderful thing you get with this new codex. It's, so, yeah. it's an interesting one, yeah. We, we, we know this game, though. We know this game. There's no point in getting angry about uh, it. We do. We've uh, seen it over 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th. Uh, it, it, there's no point in getting angry about the way it's going to be. It, but it is going to be... You know, the, the usual train of contract, cre- you know, sorry, power creep. And then after that, a fac afterwards to bring it down. But again, I don't no, mind that. I'm not the, bashing. The only critique I oh, have of just... that model, and actually it particularly pertains to Psych Awakening 9. Like every other army, it's a new edition, need a new codex, need to combine Psych Awakening and the main codex. That's got to happen. And it's good that all the armies will be valid until it is time for that to be the case. But in the specific case of Psych Awakening 9 and only Psych Awakening 9, there is now absolutely, well, almost, no reason to buy it. If you're a Necron player, anyway. Like, if you're an Inquisition player, you should probably get it so you've got the rules to tide you over. If you're someone who's fussed about the new law and where we're going in the setup for 9th, yes, absolutely buy it. But if you're a Necron player who wants the new rules, there is little to no point buying that book. Because they've already said that the codices will be cherry-picking from Psychic Awakening to port over to the new codices. I believe they mentioned that on one of the streams. So the argument goes that, okay, so Psychic Awakening is not even going to survive in its entirety going forward. So why buy it at all, especially for Necrons who are going to get their codex like two months after the new edition because they've got all these amazing new miniatures coming. And now they know how sisters have felt every (laughs) edition. Fair. Um, but while the, since we've mentioned it, um, the Necron models, can we take a minute to talk about the new Necrons? Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> They're just beautiful. Yeah. I don't know how many were forced out by GW yeah. due to the leaks. I don't know what they were planning <laughs> to show us before 9th versus what we've seen, but we've seen a new monolith. The Silent King has been pseudo-revealed. We've got War of the Worlds. We've got Phoenix Catan. New Destroyers. And Melee Destroyers with the Scorpex. And, and they are absolutely, as you say, beautiful. beautiful. Warriors. Yeah, We've got but, the Warriors. Uh, yeah, the Warriors are a, a nice upgrade. I'm not going to scream the walls down about the new Warriors. They're just nice. Um... Oh, come on. They've got that thriller thing. Thriller. I think just the main thing is I'm glad they've got rid of those little green bars because now you can paint your Necrons whatever <laughs> colour you want. <laughs> um, yeah, but you could have always yeah, painted you over lo- them. you lost the cool oh, effect. Like, I had some Necrons and I painted over the translucent mm. green in, in opaque blue mm. and it looked awful. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> um, whereas if you go with this new design, which they've borrowed off the Immortals, then A, consistency across all Gauss weapons, and B, you can paint them whatever colour you like and it will look fine. Um, but I still think one of my low-key favourite miniatures is the new Monolith. I I know the Silent King's amazing. I know the Catan's amazing. I know War of the Worlds is... Well, I, I'm calling it War of the Worlds because I don't have a better name for it. The big spindly thing with a doom gun on top. It's the best name I've got for it is War of the Worlds. I was calling it Horse or Common, yeah. Um, but for me, the monolith is one of my favourites because it's still clearly a monolith, but it's such a big improvement over a monolith. And I just love monoliths, okay? <laughs> yes, yes, I, I know what you mean. One of my best uh, player, you know, friends plays Necrons uh, religiously. It's just that they don't... They don't do a particularly large amount in eight. I mean, we've played with them anyway because we're narrative players, but mm. underwhelming. Well, it's not strong enough a word, is it really? I think that could be said for a <laughs> lot of factions in Eighth Edition, sadly. Um, but oh no, I just oh, met the one in particular. Uh, yeah, that's fair. No, not that's the Necrons. Um, I think I, I remember my not my first game ever, but one of my first games ever. Uh, it was back in fifth. 
and I one shot killed a monolith with Wazdaka guts. <laughs> But now I'm going to caveat that that I accidentally cheated to do it because I didn't realise how the rules worked. Yeah. So well, you didn't cheat. You fired it, and you were in error, and you yeah, all so had a good laugh. I thought Wazdaka had the ability to run and charge when you called a war, so I was able to run and charge him, yeah. turn one into a monolith. Now back in these days, power clouds were times two strength, and then you got plus one on top of that from Furious Charge. So he was. So he was able to glance the monolith, and because he was AP2, he got plus one on the vehicle damage table. Yes, there was such a thing as a vehicle damage table to the new people. And I got a lucky six and wrecked it on the first turn. And it was just... Wonderful. It was it was one of the most gorgeous, ridiculous moments, and it stuck with me. I mean, in fairness, it is true to... That's why we play one. It is true to look, considering that Westaker did also one-shot a Titan by himself. I mean, technically, that was by killing its princeps, not by actually killing it. Yes, but he did end up, you know, like popping a wheelie and driving into its head. And catching fire, and yeah. cracking through the head, and killing everyone in it while on fire, and has the skulls, which are still on fire, on the back of his bike for all of eternity, and it is the best thing ever. <laughs> I, I like to think that. Um, Painkiller by Judas Priest was playing as he did it. <laughs> and he was wearing his Doom Rider t shirt, yeah? Oh, naturally, um, yeah. <laughs> More like Ghost no, Rider, I, mean, I think, in this case. I don't, don't never mention Ghost Rider. Sorry. No. <laughs> My brother and I uh, trade it every Christmas. Neither of us have ever watched I haven't watched it. Um, so, we, yes, each year we give us each other the. Uh, a copy of Ghost Rider, which has never been opened. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> you should up the ante this year by giving me a copy one. of Ghost Rider 2. It's cheaper. Oh, no, no, I did that the year before. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> While we're on models, uh, since we've had a good gush yeah. about the Necrons, and, well, I have and you have, I don't know if Rome had anything to say on what? them. What? Wait a minute, but we haven't even mentioned the, the, the triplicity of their legs that everybody is moaning about them being unbalanced, which I think is fantastic because it makes them look really alien. No, you're fine. Uh, no, um, I'm over, sorry. But yeah, I do really like the new Necrons. <laughs> and I love how they, what they've done with Cesarek mm. is they. it feels like they've done... They've just looked at Catacros and said that, but bigger. And as a Terminator... Um, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, because Catacros was stood on a plinth surrounded by some bodyguards smashing everything in his way for the Ossiarch. And they've looked at that and gone, right, how do we improve on this? I know, let's add him on a floating fortress. And also, let's put a, a trapped Catan behind his back. Oh, yeah, like, it's, it's, those, just... it's those shields which float around him, which I love more than any of the rest. I mean, I love all of it. But those shields, uh, those bars, which obviously you can place anywhere you like around him, it would seem, from the picture anyway, it's just a magnificent, wonderful, sumptuous touch. Yeah, it's... I'm curious as to how powerful he's going to be. Who cares? I mean, there's a lot of... There'll be a lot of people who care, but yes, fair point. Um, when you look that good, no, he's gonna look be, that I... good who does care? Um, exactly. But yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting, and I, and I do wonder where they'll go. Uh, once the Necrons and Space Marines have had their release run. Speaking of Space Marines, actual proper Primaris melee units. Yes, I know Reavers exist. Yes, I know Captains and Lieutenants exist. I'm sorry, Blade Guard veterans yes, are sir. actual Primaris melee units. Yes, they do. And they look so right. boss. Do you know what the, the interesting thing was? Like, when the leaks came of them first, like, before they were... Well, they were actually announced. We just saw the, black, the um, unpainted... Like yep. versions of them, a lot of people thought they were grey knights, <laughs> which I, I I can see because of the you know knight style helmet. They got the big shields yes. and with a big inquisitorial eye on them, and some it looks like it. So. Well, it's also because the primaries have been rather uncandle dripping, as I call it. They haven't really had too much of the older. Uh, well, they haven't been rolled in eighties and uh, Black Sabbath, if you know what I mean. Uh, they just don't have that much about them. So when I saw them, I, I saw I knew exactly why people thought that as well, and I agreed with them because we haven't seen what skeletons attached to shields. Oh my god, it's so cool! But we haven't seen that in Primaris. So why why would we make that leap? You know. I also want to point out that I really like that new um, Judica. Oh yeah, square sword. Mm. Yeah, that's an executioner's sword. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I, I've, been, I've since been informed on how the thing works. Yeah. Um, uh, I had some oh, people yeah. saying he looked a bit like a storm cast, and with the legs, I do kind of see it. Um, but it is a really, it's a really yeah. nice model, and I bet that you could make some awesome dioramas out of it. Um, I, I just want to find the amount of people who saw the unpainted version of him and immediately thought, "Ooh, oh, yeah. Black Templar." I mean, to be fair, if you're a Black Templars player, you are loving your life right now. Because you've got <laughs> Assault Intercessors, so you can actually have a proper melee unit if you play Primaris. Oh, and you yeah. still have your Crusader squads. And now you've got, like, Sword Brethren on Redonculus. Oh, yes. And you've got this Executioner dude who looks like a Chaplain Executioner oh. from Hell. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a good time to be alive. <laughs> And and Primara spikes. Oh uh, yeah, they look chunkier. Yeah. Again, they feel very two thousand AD. Uh, obviously, they are such Sh- very Akira. Ah uh, oh, uh, yes, I've seen that as well. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. You're not wrong. <laughs> uh, they are very Akira, and it's such a great look, isn't it? Let's be honest. I think it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, I'm going to stop. No, no, you're more than fair. I, I'm not a huge fan of the, the square blocky design of Space Marine bikes. I thought it was just a problem of the times, but they decided to roll with the times <laughs> and say, you know what, just keep it that way. Uh, and that's fine. Well, you, you don't read 2000, or have never read 2000 AD then, yeah? No. That, that'll be why you don't like them. Probably, yes. No, I have, no offense. No, no, none taken. I'm just an uneducated person who doesn't read half the stuff they need to. Um... I think the one thing I didn't address when I did my original video uh, on 9th edition, I sort of skipped over it, was the new logo. Um, that's off-centre. That's off-centre and it's bugging <sighs> me to no end. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on. Yes, which is why yeah, which is why it's done on purpose, so everybody's going to you to talk about it. If they just put it out when it was centred, no one would give it even more than a... I oh, think... that's nice. Now everyone's talking about it, that's on purpose, <laughs> in my opinion. I think it's interesting that I, I first looked at it and thought, Oh, the logo's gone a bit retro because it's like it felt like it had gone retro, and yet it completely hasn't. It's gone completely futuristic compared to the old logos of Warhammer Forty K, which almost looked like they were embossed yeah. on stone. No, I tell you what, it is. It, it's it's gone into the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> it has, it has. For some reason, it reminds me of a lollipop, and I don't know why. And I, I'm not a naysayer. <laughs> you know? That's a new one. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh. I wonder if there's a fab in there. No, oh, there isn't. Oh. Um, yeah. I did say I hadn't had much sleep, sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, the logo's fine. Also, hang on a minute. The Psychic Awakening logos has still got the old logo. Like, when they talk about Psychic Awakening, it's still got the old logo on it. That's that's kind of funny. I've just realised that just now. Um, Aeon 9th. Uh, the trailer was. I thought it was awesome. The trailer was. I thought it was amazing. Staggering. Uh, yeah. Uh, just, just gorgeous, wonderful. Let's have more of that, please. Oh, yeah. Heads. I remember watching it for the first time. Uh, I was doing a snarkathon in my Discord server, and we were like, "Is this a video? A new game? Is this like a short? Is this a new animation film?" And then, and then it clicked because we we saw these like new Spider Necrons. Like, what are these Spider Necrons? And then we saw the Score Pet Lord, and our jaws just went. And just com- completely yeah, hit the exactly. floor with the Scorpec Lord, and then we realised it was ninth. It was, mm. it was a thing. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I don't know. My favourite bit was actually uh, the scarabs when they're flying around in their huge amounts, etc. And uh, I, I really thought that was a great touch. And obviously, the melting head, wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. It was just, I personally felt it was an absolutely excellent trailer. Uh, oh, I might try and pop that up on screen mm. somewhere. Uh, so, Rems just sent me a redo of the logo done by Garrett from TTS. I'm going to see if I can get it on screen. Uh, it is, well, not the meme version with Comic Sans, but the like, a sort of hardcore remix is actually really cool. So, I'll try and get that on screen uh, if I can. And I remember. And centered. And centered, yes, and centered. No. Um, in terms of new mechanics, they've introduced the new crusade system, yeah, which is sort of like AOS's path to glory campaigns where you build your army on the go, but way bigger and much more refined. Where you start off with a four hundred point, seems like four hundred points or so, five hundred points, and you build it up and up and up, earning battle scars and honors and 
turning your characters into dreadnoughts when they inevitably get domed. The weird uh, thing I find about that is I can imagine, again, I'm not certain, but I can imagine a heck of a lot of those rules, like 90% of them will actually just be what there was in the chapter of Poof 2018, I believe it was, that everyone, no one knows. No one seems to play with it ever. I've never seen a bat rep with it used ever and i thought it was a fantastic little system you know one with experience and putting on different abilities mm. uh, on on to you know making your characters actually adjustable i think it's because at the time especially uh and it's still partly true but match play in eighth edition was definitely king uh, and so those narrative campaigns and experience wasn't so that state not that it wasn't there but it certainly wasn't the focus of much of the yeah. player base and and my problem is that that statement will always be true while it's trumpeted that is true uh, but this it feels like they've really tried to push narrative play this edition so um even in matched play <laughs> well with yeah. crusade which they've sort of that's the poster child of this edition is Crusade in many ways. Oh, I'm not um, arguing with you. Um, what I think is is they're, they're going to put na- push narrative play. Uh, again, I just have a concern, and it's not bashing them either, that it's because uh, competitive play is going to be a little bit more brutal. Well, they certainly have done a lot to <laughs> match play, which I was coming on to in a moment. Uh, but mm. even keeping the narrative, what I've, what I've actually quite liked about what they've done to match play um, is that... They've added in, I think this is taken straight from ITC, uh, one of the big tournament organizers. They've added in these secondary objectives that you can pick for your army to do. So you can actually specialize your army slightly. So you've still got to play the mission, but you also get a pile of victory points off doing what you oh, want. No, of course, to. yeah. It's about, it's about one or two turns worth of VP just by doing what your army does really well. I mean, which is good as well. I mean, ITC and our such things had some really good ideas. And obviously then bringing in one of the, uh, you know, tournament organisers to help with the entire running of, of their match play situation is going to have bonuses like this. Because they are good. Uh, people, if they play match play, want control. Yep. And if you're going to take away a lot of the things like the um, detachments and <laughs> and uh, CP situation, which I'm not touching with a barge bar, I think it's hilarious and I love it. But I can see why many many are uh, uh, wailing and lamentation will go on. Mm, the old CP, <laughs> well, well, the eighth CP system. It's not the old system just yet. Um, the eighth system had not yet. lots of great concepts. I think this was what eighth was. Like, eighth was a brilliant concept of reshaking up the <coughs> game, it just had a couple of, well, a few minor flaws, like, why can't my tank shoot when it's covered in grots? And, <laughs> uh, well, and then the major fundamental... <laughs> it was true, that's how it worked. I am well aware. <laughs> I have parked many, 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 many a Tyranid Gaunt next to a, 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 a Land Raider and laughed. <laughs> it is ridiculous. Uh, but... I think the command points and the ability to generate huge amounts of it, particularly when soup was a lot more pronounced, did hurt some people's view of 8th edition. And so what they've done with 9th is they flipped attachments and CP on their head. So now... You... Well, I, again, I mean, the rusty, the rusty firm was it thirteen or fifteen or whatever, seventeen? Sorry, the the loyal thirty-two. I mean, that made it a really just more of a textbook and tapping kind of situation here. It was accountancy one hundred and one to see what could maximise. Whereas, I mean, I will always prefer mono builds. Again, I like to be able to have options to do anything and bring in other forces, etc., which you now can. But it's very annoying when people turn around and say the rules are broken. Uh, no matter how many people, even if they've got 200 rules writers in a room, they can never, ever outthink 100 to 200,000 players who are trying to break the game. So, uh, one of those things, isn't it? Yeah, that's very fair. Uh, but what they have done with detachments is, as I say, <coughs> flipped it on its head. So, let's say you're playing 2K, 2K points, because uh, they've got four game sizes now, 500, okay. 1K, 2K, 3K. Uh, let's say you're playing at 2,000 points. You get, I think it's 12 CP to start with, and then you buy your detachments using CP. Um, you're allowed three detachments in a 2,000-point game, and you pay for each of them a certain okay. amount. Yeah. But if you take a core detachment that includes your warlord, so you take a patrol, a battalion, or a brigade, that detachment, and only that detachment, is free. So if you run a pure mono build using 
patrol battalion brigade as scaling, and <coughs> that is your warlord and is your only detachment, you get the most CP. You want allies, you pay for that. You want some extra elites in another detachment, you pay for that. You want to take a slightly janky army that is reliant on heavy support, you pay for that. But I think it's going to be interesting to watch how they deal with knights and how they deal with Drakari, both of whom either rely on lots of detachments, in the Drakari's case, or can't unlock most of those detachments, in the knight's case. Um, yeah. No. It's, it's going to be an interesting Well, one. it should be, and obviously we don't know all of the rules that are out yet. They're going to be changing things as things go. We know there's going to be power creep, etc. But starting off with the perspective that actually someone's starting off with one force instead of... <laughs> Uh, cherry picking everything and then putting it all together which is fun unto itself trust me i spent a lot i mean a lot of time on battle scribe i love it too but it just gets a bit annoying when people first turn slaughter you because of what they've done you know uh, mm. i think it wants to be a fun game again and um i think this kind of move towards making it difficult to munchkin and make it rewarded for playing a narrative almost not not a narrative army but a cohesive law army helps mm. again you should always have the options but it should always be well instead of 15 different ragamuffins all working together blood angels why because they're one army they know what they're doing they work with the other, each other more effectively that should always be more powerful to a certain extent from my well, certainly from a, a cohesive command perspective not necessarily pure power but certainly cohesive command which is what they're trying to reflect um and i think it is difficult for the rules writers um which is probably why three ways to play was introduced in the first place because there is a competitive aspect the tournament people in the community who love doing this sort of thing who love coming up with the craziest builds and go into town with it and i see the appeal it's absolutely hilarious when you pull it off I never quite got it because I was never good enough at the game to get it. But there is a huge appeal to not quite going on a one army power trip. That's the wrong way of putting it. But to getting a list to work just the way you want it and going to town with it is great. Then you've got people like yourself and like me who are more like, okay, I like the flavor and I like the fluff and I like a cohesive army that fits with my army's law. And now they're trying to hybridize that by saying, okay, Match play gamers, you can have all of the powerful tools you want to create the exact armor you would like. However, if you want to play more narratively, you will not be punished for doing so. It will feel more like, as a general, you are more in control. It's, it's an interesting challenge of what they've tried to do, to try and allow narrative gamers to hang with the competitive players and also incentivize the match play crowd to reflect and do a bit more narrative building to reap the benefits of it. It's an interesting idea, and we'll see how it shakes out in terms of power levels uh, and also costings, because everything is getting a points hike. Hmm. It's going to be interesting to see. I'm curious, and I'm kind of excited for it. Well, also, again, when people say, you know, it's, it's exciting to see, absolutely. And the most exciting thing for me, though, is, again, that they've got a tournament organiser at the helm who will listen. We'll know what the problems are, but again, most things about tournament organisers that I've ever met, God, they're hardworking, is the fact that although they may say no a million times, they're listening for 700,000 mm. of them. They are actually listening and then going to take those, those, those actual rules and those queries and then move them forward. I think it's an exceptionally good move from um, Games Works yet again. And I'm really, really optimistic about that yeah. for the I tournament think players. That they've streamlined the game for comp, which is great. They've added a bit more flavor for narrative. Obviously, no plan survives contact, and we'll have to see how it actually plays when it comes out. Um, how the new, more narratively incentivized terrain rules will work. That looks interesting. Whether whether the new blast weapons will be fair, whether the new flyer interactions will make more sense and stop the Eldar flyer uber jank that was minus three to hit all the time. They've also nerfed modifiers to be a maximum of plus minus one, which is probably for the best after watching Eldar flyers do all the jank in the world, apparently, so I've heard. Did, did, they, did they hurt you? No, but apparently they were awful <laughs> on comp because they were base blocking everyone and also like a permanent minus three to hit. 
They were apparently awful mm. to face. But, I mean, everyone has their time to shine, and there's always a horrible combination for a short while. Um, yeah, there was also, don't disagree with that. Uh, what is it? Oh, Storm Raven's spam at the beginning of 8th? That was quite nasty. Mm, it, it, there's definitely been a lot. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes going forward. Um, Rem, you just sent me something, and I think you want to shout about it. Yeah, so they also um, are re-releasing Horus Rising in hardback again, but it's got a new cover that looks like absolute dog shit. <laughs> like, it's sky blue and gold coloration. It's like, who thought that was a good combination of colours? Um, it really does not... It looks like a school textbook. <laughs> I wouldn't go as far as school textbook, but it does not look like a Gaze Workshop Black Library production. I'll certainly go with you on that. No, no, I, I'm afraid I'm with Rem, actually. It looks like a... You, you know, at the, at the end of your syllabus, you, you've got a, a, a small play that you have to read and you have to kind of possibly attend. It looks like a flyer for that. It looks like a generic physics textbook. Oi! Yeah. Oh, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally my job now. Oi. Don't worry, you got an opportunity to give all your kids a copy of Horus Rising now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be the day if I were get that one past HR. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I mean, looking at it, they ain't going to tell the difference, are they? <laughs> 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 we'll see. We'll... <laughs> is, like, why does it say Masterworks on it? Is that like the publisher? I'm, I'm not sure if that's a publisher or if it's part of like you know a sub series type thing. Like they're gonna put like, a bunch of like you know really popular novels in this like mini series or something. I don't know. Yeah. But like like they already have a, a cover format will, for that. Will, it's the yeah. Siege of Terror format with the hardback and the clasp and all that no, stuff. No, I, I think it's also going to maybe include things like you know standard four K novels, like maybe like the Eisenhorn novels or like. Some of the Warhammer Fantasy novels maybe mixed in. I don't know. The cream of the crop, yeah, the true. Masterworks collection. That's, that's what. That's what at the top has got. Like, you know, the Horus Heresy at the top. So it tells you what series it's actually from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, GCSE physics. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, oh, while we're on books, uh, physical books are back. Uh, Black Library are back. Uh, 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 fi- stuff. Uh, not on Black Library and says on Games Workshop, but not Black Library. <laughs> really? Right. On Black on How Black does Library that work out? on Black Library itself, you can only get ebooks and um, digital audio books and MP3s and all that. Uh, but physical books you can get from Games Workshop themselves. Yeah, so some of the examples they talk about, <laughs> okay. they've got uh, here like Sons of uh, Sons of Selenar went on pre-order. Uh, there's a few. Uh, classic heresy books of, that went on short-term pre-order, like Fear to Tread, uh, Betrayer. Oh, yeah, the made-to-order ones, yeah. Made-to-order, is that it? Uh, a couple of new Warhammer adventures for Chirodron and Orcs, depending on which side of the system you're on. Uh, and there's a few book, couple of books in other languages. Uh, they're just... Oh, speak, speak, speaking of the other language ones, one thing that's quite interesting, um, for some reason, the French are getting a Horus Heresy omnibus. Uh, the Horus Heresy Collection 3, Legion, La Bataille des Abysses, uh, Mechanicum. Okay, yeah, Legion, The Battle of the Abyss, and Mechanicum. Has that been an omnibus before? I don't recall that one. I mean, I, I remember seeing, um, you know, Horus Rising, Galaxy in Flames, and False Gods as one omnibus, and Burning of Prospero and um, A Thousand Suns as another omnibus, but not seeing that one in English. Yeah, I don't even know how well they connect together because Mechanicum is the schism of Mars. Which one's yeah. Battle for the Abyss? Uh, it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what, that, that might be why I don't remember it, but I don't even remember. Oh, was it Foul? I think Battle so. For the Abyss Foul? <laughs> I think so. I think it was Foul. Um, which has nothing to do with the Mechanicum at all. And oh, the other one's the Alpha Legion. Back. Yeah, a bit disjointed, that one. Um, but yeah, that's now a thing that is back. Um, was there a, another set of books they talked about? No, they didn't. Um, so just to wrap up with Ninth Ed, there or new things that have happened because of Ninth Ed. I do actually, I forgot to talk about the um, the law of uh, the end of Psyche Awakening, but I've missed it now, so I'll come back to it later. 
Um, they've got a mer- well, we've got the action figures, and we have a merch store. Oh yeah, <sighs> we do. Yep, we do. Yeah, Warhammer merchandise is a thing. Oh, oh dear. Yeah, we're, uh, if I ever come on again, we'll have to do it on a Saturday. So I've actually had some time to look up. No, I'm so it's, sorry. it's fine. Um, what, what 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 kind of merch is there? We like didn't say merch. I mean, I, 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 I'm actually done. quite scared. There's oh, shirts, that's right. Hoodies, trout, like joggers. Nothing that contains uh, batteries. I mean, I've always said trout. Eh? I've always said trout for a second. I, I started to say trousers, then realised that was wrong, so I, I corrected myself. You um, definitely said trousers. Phone cases, mugs, oh, trousers. A couple of poster prints, laptop cases. It's a mix of stuff. Um, apparently, according to some people, it's pretty well priced. I'm not an expert on merch, as I've said in my video on the topic. Um, and most of it's quite simple. Like, a lot of it is slight variations on codex art. But there's one that I saw, which was a Jez Goodwin sketch on a T-shirt. Oh, like, yeah, that's it, an one, yeah. The Jez Goodwin Dark Reapers sketch mm. on a T-shirt. Uh, which was nice. And I kind of want the towel phone case because my old phone case is past its best and needs replacing. But yeah, that's a, a definitely thing. Uh, definitely a thing that exists. And uh, we'll see if people go for it, I guess. Um, it depends how many beers they've had, really. Um, I'm sure they'll, they'll get loads on a Saturday night. Well, maybe when the pub's open. No, no, way after the pub. <laughs> No, the pubs aren't even open to be after the pub yet. Why would you bring that up again? Sorry. I, mean, I don't drink. Damn so you, Steve Carino. Sorry? <laughs> you don't drink. Well done. How I, healthy I'm nuts, you? I know. Um, He's too young. I'm, tw- I'm nearly 24, <laughs> Remley. <laughs> Sorry? I, I know I'm... You're 24 and you don't drink. Never started. My dad had a transplant when I was 12. I don't have a liver transplant. Never went back to alcohol. Not, not. He didn't have a transplant because of alcohol, but he gave up alcohol after the transplant. Ergo, I never had an incentive to start. Fair enough. Um, okay. But anyway, I, I respect your decision. Um, also, new action figures. Let's get back into something a bit more positive. Um, so after the Bandai action figures, which have been met with mostly positive, if not perfect, results, McFarlane have released a Necron Warrior, or are going to release a Necron Warrior. And a assault intercessor. I thought it was a sergeant. Hmm? I thought it was a sergeant because the helmet. Oh yeah, it's a sergeant. It's just I, I went. Oh, it's the sergeant featured in the trailer, so it's probably an assault intercessor sergeant. <laughs> My main problem with these is that they're not going to be in scale with the Bandai figure because they're smaller. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Not they're good. seven inches in total. Is that all? That's hmm. what she said. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Yeah, name of your sex tape. <laughs> um. oh, right. Um, but either way, they look pretty good. The uh, Necron reminds me a lot like a Bionicle. Oh, oh dear. All right, yeah. Uh, c- can you put a picture that you're looking at onto the um, uh, Discord? I'll ping you the link. See, I've only actually got one monitor, so uh, I'm sorry. That's so right. So that's oh, the we go. article in question. Uh, <coughs> and they do say that there's going to be other ones. So there'll be an unpainted intercessor, like an actual intercessor. So you can actually now have a paintable yep. Bandai action figure rather than it having to be an ultra. Mc- McFarlane. McFarlane, not McFarlane, Bandai. McFarlane, yeah. Sorry, a paintable McFarlane action figure now, that doesn't have to be an Ultramarine. Now, is it just me, or is the Necron's gun a bit wonky? It, it is most definitely wonky, and I'm not really keen on the green. I mean, I, I understand these are these are prototypes, you know, so it's probably not going to be, you know, evocative of the final thing, but it does seem... Like, like yeah, with yeah, the, um, it, it, it is the first time the world's seeing it, so you would actually expect them to have got it right. True. Also, is it just me or is the um, the Primaris figure? His shoulder pads are a bit low. Small. I was a bit low down. But yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel like this should be a little little higher. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, Don't I didn't it. see it I until you said it, but now I can't it. unsee it. <laughs> but again, these are prototypes that are being shown, so you know, they might be improved. Uh, they don't actually say that they're prototypes no 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 it, it does and uh, if you look at the at the bottom of like you know the um the 
the one with the white background, like with the Necron, at the very bottom it says prototype um, subject to change. Oh, yes, it does, actually. In that very, very tiny print. Yes, they do. They do. You're right. Good spot. Missed that one. And also, the sergeant's pistol seems very small as well. (laughs) Certainly compared to the... Literally, they've got it in the trailer underneath, and it's like, (laughs) okay, that's a bolt gun. That's... I, I tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of any time that Rob Liefeld tries to draw a gun in his comics. <laughs> <laughs> it just basically just a rectangle. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, Leefield. Uh, always funny. <laughs> I haven't talked about Leefield in about a decade. <laughs> Manlays, what have you done? What? <laughs> I feel like you might, you might have just awakened something there <laughs> with that. All I did was mention Rob Liefeld. <laughs> you know, the man who did like the most poorly proportioned Captain America ever. Yes, yes. I don't, I don't think anyone's going to forget that particular image, no. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Steve Rogers, if that's still his name. Yeah. Um. Right. I just want to backtrack a second um, since I've got since we've got law people, um, to talk about what they've done uh, with setting up S- Ninth Edition, what the uh, sort of well, the last Psyche Awakening story says, uh, because it's it's set from Cesaris's perspective, um, and it actually talks about like, sort of almost to gives a science behind how the Psyche Awakening has happened. Oh, yeah, uh, I had to actually read that out for another member in one of uh, the. The groups, etc., and it, it, it may read fine, but it sounds awful. Um, but there's, there's a lot in there actually, because they do mention a new human force coming out, etc., as well. But if you listen carefully, but um, it is a bit techno jargony, bubbly, bubbly, and uh, mm, necrons, yes. But uh, again, you could say that, well, technically a Doctor Who episode because his IQ should be, it, you know, no one should understand him. Alternately, you can describe something with normal words if you have the ability. Uh, just an opinion, though. Or wibbly wobbly timey wimey index. Well, yeah, way. yeah, that was one statement in like 60 years, mate. <laughs> Fair. It became a bit of a running joke, I think, during for a bit. But uh, yes, I know, do know what you mean. Um, but what they have done with this new story is they have suggested that the Psyche Awakening originally was, well, warp-based. So the warp's um, influence of the expansion of the Psychiatric Maledictum has caused a lot more psychic activity amongst all species. Um, they comment on orcs, they comment on humans, they comment on Hrad even. Um, but then they discuss what the Necrons are doing about it with this sort of counter-empiric matrix that is spreading out across the galaxy and because they've rushed it i know necrons rushed something despite their infinite patience they rushed it um and it's causing more psychic activity to flare up at the edges of this sort of blanket if you like and maybe that's why the psychic awakening um i I didn't read it that way i saw it as their reaction to the psychic awakening and the wake in front might be a build-up of empiric energy indeed but that again that's just a a micro uh, event surrounding their yeah you're probably right but again it's only my perspective you know yeah i think you're probably right that the psychic awakening came from the maledictum and some of it was made worse by the expansion of this Null blankets, as I'm going hmm. to call it, until I get a better name. But I mean, the psychic awakening has been hinted at in Rogue Trader. So, you know, 33 years of foreshadowing, I think it's about time. Why not? I wasn't even alive. I can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't Frank. alive when that was written, so I am in no position to comment. Uh, but yeah, it's an Fair interesting enough. discussion that they have Thanks about what's going on um, and sort of keeping it very quiet about the fact that it's Cesaric because I think they've released this story assuming Psychic Awakening 9 had happened and they've not really changed the release schedule of the stories, meaning that now we're getting the Psychic Awakening 9 story just before Psychic Awakening 9's release or just after Psychic Awakening 9's release, give or take. Um, So, yeah, I think that's interesting. Um... And we'll see exactly where the Necrons are going in the new edition 
whenever it comes out. When do you think it will come out? Because normally new editions come out in July, but obviously this is an extraordinary year. So mm. are we still thinking it will be a July drop when they rush to get there or are they going to hold it back? They're probably going to hold it back to probably around May, like September or something. If I had to guess. All bets are off. Because mm. they have got to sneak the Lumineth and the Sons of Bayamart out and two Psychic Awakening oh, books well, and so then so. drop ninth. Uh, so they've got plenty to get through before they get to ninth, I could say. Uh, uh, alternatively, they might just cut and run, knowing full well that, okay, it doesn't matter what we say about the Psychic Awakening books, they're gone. We've written it off. Let's just, just, just move forward. But they Again, have to you, you them. can't tell. You can't tell. Oh, no, they will release them, but they could release them next week and then the week after. I'm not saying they will, but I'm just saying they could. Yeah, they absolutely could. As for what is coming out this week, though, or going on pre-order, mm. New Tiny Planes, uh, Aeronautica's first expansion uh, with the Astro Militarum and the Tau uh, going head-to-head uh, mm. in Skies of Fire and the Taros Air War campaign book. So new fighters, you've got the Lightning, the Valkyrie, as well as the Barracuda and variants on the Tiger Shark, as well as a new board, and some of the cutest dice I've ever seen. The Aircast dice are adorable and so simple, and I kind of love them. <laughs> um, to be honest, I, I think this is the first... Like, Aeronautica was cool when it came out, and I, I wasn't that tempted to buy into it, but I'm more tempted to buy the Barracuda and the Tiger Shark than I was the Daka Jet and the Fighter Bomber. Like, I could see myself buying it even if I know I don't have anyone to play it with. No, oh, that's a shame. Oh, no, I see what you mean. I mean. Don't you have a local club? Uh, well, I'm about to move. I'm moving house very soon. Um, so whilst my local GW is a thing right now, it's currently closed. And by the time I got <coughs> my tiny planes ready, I'd be leaving the area and going to a new area um, with people I don't know. Um, but I'm not against playing it against other people. And hopefully I can find the time because... In an ideal world, where I'm going for my new job, I'll find a colleague who actually also plays and will play it in the staff room over <coughs> lunch. <laughs> like, that's the dream, is, all right, what are we doing? Uh, can we bring 500 points and have a game over lunch? Sure, I'm not on duty, I ain't got any tensions to do. Yeah, sure, we'll have a game over lunch. Oh, well, I'll just have a game of 40k or a game of Aeronautica or something over lunch, which would be gorgeous. It's, not gonna, it's never going to happen, but that's, that's the dream. Oh, well... Uh, oh, I hope you have that dream realised, my friend. Either way, though, I'm buying the Aircast dice because I haven't got any Tau-specific dice. And whilst normally I don't buy faction dice, these are really nice faction dice. <laughs> or is it, it might just be me. It, it, it's almost certainly just me. Nah, why not? If you like it, get it. Go for it. That's what it's all about, isn't it? If it brings you joy, as they say. Quite. Uh, I think we've just about broke the back of the news. Just about. Uh, it's only taken us an hour and <coughs> ten minutes. <laughs> I mean, there is some stuff about Engine War, but no one cares about that. <laughs> well, yes, Engine, Engine, War, Engine War is now going to be out by the time you're watching this episode, along with all the new Skatari, <coughs> uh, the, the, uh, with the cavalry and the flyers and the stuff. And that's great, but I think we've had plenty of time to prepare for that, with obviously that being what was about to come out before everything got closed. So... The hype train for that kind of got lost in the shuffle, unfortunately. Fair enough. So, Rem, have you had a chance to read much in the past couple of weeks? Well, I'm sure you have. You, you always do. <laughs> um, yeah, I recently managed to finish um, Path of the Renegade, which is part of the Path of the Dark Eldar series. Um, not by Gaffor, but by Andy Chambers, the series. Yeah, I got that one wrong <laughs> earlier. My bad. Yeah. It's quite an interesting one, actually, because um, it basically starts good. off with, you know, Three archons with three separate cabals, basically all coming together, like saying, "Hey, you know, we're kind of sick of Vex shit, and we want to try and overthrow him, but none of us are actually good enough to overthrow him. We need to get someone who's actually capable of doing so. So, what do we do? How are they? How are they archons? <laughs> At that point, if you're saying that about Vex and plotting against Vex, you're dead. <laughs> So, but, I mean, no, no. oh, don't worry. I'll meet up with two other lovely people. I'm sure they will so actually put What they do, in they basically. <laughs> How are they alive? They uh, concoct a plan to basically resurrect Vex's greatest rival, an archon named Aluriac, who was basically the master of Shardon. Oh, which, for those who don't know, was an area that, you know, pretty. We haven't seen them since it... Fifth, have we? Vect collapsed it and merged it into Comrade, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it was 
close to over. Uh, they were about to pretty much to see, and then Vex said, "Hey, um, I, I'm just gonna, you know, allow demons to invade your realm and see you off. Bye, bye. Have fun. Fuck you." <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So these archons, they go to Shardon and to basically, uh, well, they they send their minions to Shardon rather to basically collect Illyriac's remains, um, and they also conduct a raid on a Exodite world to basically kidnap a world singer because a world singer is needed to bring someone back who's been dead for over thousands of years. They need a quote pure soul, which has to be a world singer. Um, so they resurrect Illyriac and. Oh, uh, guess what? Um, yeah, turns out when they brought his body back, um, there's now a demon inside oh, him. I mean, I was wondering, yeah, yeah. like, uh, you mentioned yeah. this earlier, like, what happens to Dark Eld? Well, we know what happens to Dark Eldar souls, but how Sorry. do you get a Dark Eldar soul back when you res them? Uh, stay tuned for that video. Um, <laughs> yeah, th that's your problem, Rem. I only do kiddie stuff, you know me. Oh, just, <laughs> just, just the death core of Creed. Yeah, proper kiddie stuff, that. Oh, all right. I didn't mean kiddie stuff. I mean starter stuff. Yeah, I mean, apologies. You're absolutely correct. Um, <laughs> Basic stuff. But yeah, stuff. it's it's an interesting idea. And yes, okay, fine. Dark Eldar possessed by demon equals utter murder rampage. I bet is that how it ends? Uh, no, it ends somewhat like abruptly. <laughs> to be honest, because um, basically Alluriax basically gathered all of his conspirators okay. and supporters to, like this big feast, or whatever. And he goes like, hey, so, um, you know, I know some of you aren't willing to support me right away or maybe think about turning traitor, which is why every piece of food here has been poisoned. Um, but the poisons aren't detectable because they're, yeah. each poison is designed to interact with another piece of food. So what you've been eating, if you have been eating the right things, you'll be fine. If not, you're going to mm -hmm. die. And one Archon explodes, one Archon turns into a statue, one Archon has a seizure that's so bad he literally folds himself in half and rips himself into pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, proper, proper, you know, Drew Carey stuff. Um, <coughs> and as they're basically, you know, making the final preparations, um, the oh, world singer, who's now basically been chained to Aluriac's throne, you know, she goes like, "Hey, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna sing you a song in in honor of you, uh, Aluriac." And he's like, "Okay, go on then." So she sings a song, and um, yeah, it turns out um, now everyone's now affected with a glass plague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, so everyone's now a fucking statue. Whoops. <laughs> Well, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be the Drakari without everyone getting backstabbed at least five hundred times. But <laughs> there's some interesting um, scenes. Like there's a little subplot of these um, two homunculi basically trying to one up each other, hmm. and one of them basically like um, yep. gets hold of this um, little device that temporarily opens a warp rift, like literally within a split second, to basically have demons kill everything in the room within a second. And he tries to offer to this other homunculi as a gift, and the other homunculi is like, yeah, um, I'm not going to buy a shit. Uh, you, you see this piece of glass I'm holding? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, do you know what this is? It's a shatter, shatter shard. Do you know what happens? If your reflection's caught in it, and I break this glass, you break too. Smash. <laughs> I love the way they use a lot of very, very old English magic in that kind of thing and mythology yeah. <laughs> to really show the horror of of what that kind of magic does, etc. It's just, yeah, it's just really oh, good yeah. fun. And it actually, it's it was quite <coughs> nice. Well, I, I saw the TTS short of Russ bullying the Drakari. Um, oh, I haven't seen it yet. Don't tell me, don't right, tell me. Fine. Let's just yet. say that Sorry. whilst it's not on the level of Path of the Renegade, it's creepy in a very good way. Oh, Fredrickson now, isn't he? Uh, As one of the Drukari, I'm pretty sure he is. I thought Frederick... No, Frederick played Eldrad, not Vect. Sorry, wrong way around. Uh, he might be. I forget the credits. Of the he, he, was al he was also the um, the one in the red armour. The Drukari in the red armour, I think it was. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. With yeah. the pirate voice. Yeah, enough said about that guy. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I'm not spoiling anything. I'm not said about that guy. No, I'll, I'll, I'll look you forward to this now. Yep, take a while. I shall yeah, watch it later. It's fun. Um, yeah. So yeah, fair enough. Um, I think the Drakari novels particularly are your thing or they're not your thing, I think. Uh, I, they sound I, really cool, but I don't know if I could sit through one. 
I'd recommend this one. It's actually a pretty fun book, to be fair. Have you read either of the other two, or is this the one the first one in the list? This is the first one in the series. Right. But I would recommend it. It's actually a pretty good book. Fair. Also, also interesting side note, um, apparently orcs need sunlight to live. Pardon? Yeah. When 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 did when did this happen? In in this book, it mentions about how you know about an orc like trapped without sunlight, you know, basically becomes really weak. So um, photosynthesis, mother trucker. Uh, yeah, mm, proper plant mm, boys. Mm. Okay, okay, fair enough. So they've confirmed that they now believe that so photosynthesis is is why how they get their energy then. Well, it's partially at least. Uh, well, yes, 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 yes. Oh, how well, fair. I mean, there are some ones that have photosynthesis. Uh, do, do the orcs know this? Probably not. Um, well, actually, actually no, I mean, they probably no, do. Wait. The evil suns is a thing that go fast, so you go fast when you have more kinetic energy. Wait, what if this is an entirely a massive long con? Hmm. <laughs> oh, dear. Yep, fair enough. It, it probably is. It's pro- like, you know, that whole thing about the Alpha Legion being a double cross Legion and then Legion 20, which is two X's. Yeah. Mm. GW are yep. very good at references yep. that pay themselves off in the subtlest ways. Oh, speak, speaking of not subtle references, <laughs> I have to point this out because it was something that made me cringe so fucking hard. So, oh, no. um, so Warhammer Community put an article about, you know, languages in the Underhive the other day. Oh, and, yeah. And some of the languages that Van Saar use, like, they have a language called Technikel. And not only that, but they use words such as, quote, hashtag, which means everything I say is now connected. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, do you really give the Van Sar have Van Sar use hashtag in their languages? What the fuck? Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I mean, they, they, I mean, here's here's the thing. Here's the full thing. It's just like you know, these eight, it's a form of ancient terror and using words such as "does right" to denote, to denote someone speaking true and "hashtag," a word that can mean everything I say is now connected or heed my words for they carry great import. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay, well played. Who I. It's cringeworthy, yes, but it's also brilliant, <coughs> and I, I, I kind of have to give them points. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Dear, oh dear. I mean, it, it, first, it's still not as good as that one time, yeah, because you know, like ages ago, when there was that whole thing when Peter wanted, you know, Games Workshop to get rid of the models wearing fur for some fucking reason, oh, God, yes. and, oh, and then, oh, and then oh, Games God, Workshop's so response good. was to have a thing like, uh, hey, um, here's a story about some animal rights activists that tried to rescue some Kachachan face eaters, and they all got killed by them. Yeah, yeah, I know, I love that. response to Peter was, hey, here's all our cool models that wear fur. It's not like, like Terran fur, we, maybe we don't stand It's plastic. That, hello. <laughs> <laughs> like, they just absolutely oh, yeah. dunks on them. It was it yeah, was uh, it was quite the scenes. It was funny. I enjoyed that. To be honest, that summer, that was a jolly one. I I think certainly GW have definitely stepped up there. Like Twitter game is the wrong word, though. Also, probably not that far off. Like their sort of clapback meme. I can't use this terminology without cringing. Never mind. Uh, but they've got good at repost. I think that's a, that. There now, I sound fancy enough to get away with it. No, fair enough. Uh, but no, I mean they they had such a long period of non-engagement at all. It is wonderful, it is really wonderful. But it doesn't matter if they actually succeed or fail at this moment in getting everything right. At least they actually have a lot more avenues. Whereas you feel that you might get something going on. Might yeah. At least the, the doors, their ears are open whether they actually listen to anything or not. It's another matter. And that's all down to someone's perspective, isn't it? On whether they get yeah, what they want or not. They, oh, hey, here's Primaris Pikers. We know you wanted those. <laughs> oh, hey, here's Sisters of Battle. We know you wanted those. <laughs> well, although that's true, it's also the assumptive sale. So, yeah. True, true, true. Uh, I think, yeah. Oh, no, train of thought's gone. Um, Choo-choo. Any other books, Rem, or do I get to talk about now? Uh, I started reading um, Emperor's Re- uh, sorry, Regent Shadow, but I have, I've only gone through sh- chapter one, so you might as well talk, talk about um, City of Light. 
Yeah, so I got round to finishing Mephiston City of Light, um, and Rem summed it up quite nicely while we were getting ready for the show. Um, basically, Mephiston in law is second edition Mephiston. Mm. Like, Tabletop so voice, ridiculously... Yeah. <laughs> oh, so ridiculously OP, it's not even funny. So, when Mephiston... This takes place post-Primaris. Mm. So, Mephiston has now been Primaris in this book. Um, and it makes reference constantly to the fact that his soul has been split in yeah. three. So, there was Calistarius, the original. There was Mephiston, that was born on Armageddon when he went Black Rage and yep. came back again. Of course. And there's this third part uh-huh. that was created when he was Primaris on the Rubicon. Because, Bob again, indeed. he died there. And it plays up this tripartite soul a little bit. And <sighs> it tries to set up that, basically, Mephiston yeah, is the enough. doom of the Blood Angels. Uh, it's almost sort of what they mm-hmm. what they want you to think is that Mephiston is the doom of the Blood Angels. The way Mephiston sees it is he is carrying all the hell of the Blood Angels on him to save the Blood Angels from ever having to deal with it. Mm. And whilst I haven't read Darkness in the Blood, I would be intrigued to see, since it's called Darkness in the Blood, whether they make reference to that in that particular novel and how well they cross over between the Hinks books and the Haley books. Um, because obviously Haley's is Dante and Hinks is a Mephiston, but they cross over quite a lot. Mm. Um, so the book is centred uh, or the book part of the book that I'm on uh, I got to so we talked in the previous episode about the mind jacking Eldari um, to make them mm. kill each other and stuff uh, which was cool um, so they land in the uh, in this place like this, through this webway portal to go and find a way through the Cicatrix Maledictum using um, basically the webway yeah. and they get ambushed by Harlequins pretending to look like um, Chaos Space Marines to trigger the Black Rage, which, or at least trigger the thirst, and it takes, mm. they have to realise, wait, hang on, we're not hallucinating about Horus, we're just being mind-tricked. And so they have to fight their way out of it, which is quite interesting. And mm-hmm. Mephiston basically goes all magician on this Harlequin. He's like, oh, you want to stab me with this like super awesome weapon? Yeah, it's already in my hand. Oh, you, you don't want to take us through the webway? Yeah, I have this super important relic and I'm going to smash it if you don't do what I tell you to. And so on and so forth. Um, so they get to the world that sort of is the primary focus of the battle where essentially what's revealed at the end is a demon of Zinch, um, I think it might be a demon prince, I forget, is trying to reactivate nine silver towers um, known to the locals as the brothers, these mountains. Um, so there are nine mountains and they're all silver towers but no one knows it um, and you watch the guard, the local PDF guard regiment go from uh, putting down rebels to half of them being traitors and being cultists and then they all get sacrificed obviously because chaos is evil and has to be shown to be evil because chaos is fundamentally evil um, and then it's the blood angels come in afterwards and Mephiston goes up to this general and is like you tell me and he sort of hijacks this general's mind to stop him going insane. Um, so he's sort of like, right, I'm going to put a shield there. You're now not going to go insane from all the chaos stuff. You're just going to tell me about the chaos stuff. And at some point, you are going to snap. In It, it might be in 10 minutes. It might be in 20 years. You're going to snap and die. And it's going to be horrible. But I need you right now, so I'm going to do this. Yeah, Mephiston's not nice. Um, so they go into the Silver Tower and essentially... Or into, into one of these silver towers, and the demon runs off, but they're also caught in an ambush. Now, Mephiston showed earlier in the book that he can essentially step out of time. So, sort of, not pause yeah. time, but sort of take himself out of the time stream and spend ages there. Um, so, what he does while in the time stream is he has to s- save the Blood Angels from being mm. annihilated by this Thousand Suns ambush and chase this demon down. And also stop this device from turning to prevent mm. the towers from activating. I think you can see where mm. this is going. Yeah, he breaks himself so, into three. So he, uh, he does. Yeah. He puts his soul on the device mm-hmm. to stop it from spinning. Mm-hmm. He puts his mind into the head of his like other librarian to try and guide him through what's about to happen. Mm. And he sends his body which basically looks like a blood demon and like all the people who he 
encounters afterwards think he's a demon of corn and he sends mm. him to Sortiarius. Um, All right. Because the demon has run off to Tizka. Not Prosper and Tizka, Sortiarius is Tizka. I know, there's two, it seems like there's two of them. Uh, but the Sortiarius Tizka. Okay. And this Mephiston doesn't have his mind, doesn't have his soul. He's just consumed with. It's basically, he, he is the black rage personified at that point. He barely knows who he is. He's constantly forgetting who he is, forgetting why he's there. But, and he looks like a blood-winged, blood-formed demon of hell. And it's brilliant. And he gets his way into Tizka, and the demon thinks he's got him. Because this other librarian, Antros, has been playing a big part in the book, and is a big part of the series, actually. And he sort of accidentally been turned by this Zinch demon to be used as the conduit because this librarian is also slightly OP not as OP but also slightly OP so he goes off on his own to go and find another silver tower against Mephiston's orders um, and he gets there and the demon says right got you now and he uses Mephiston to try and power up the towers and the librarian to sort of focus it and also power it up a bit more and he's got him He's, he's got, he thinks he's got Mephiston, all ends up, bang, bang, there you go, nine silver towers, everyone's doomed. Except Mephiston told the librarian about this staff, this antique staff that he's also cracked at some point during the book. And he says, put your trust in person whose staff this used to belong to. And he does. And all of a sudden, well, we don't see what happens, but... In the next chapter, the demon goes sauntering up to Magnus in Tizka, bold as brass, saying, Look at what I did! I activated all your silver towers, I tricked the blood angels, and Magnus is just like, No, you didn't. You blew them up. You, you destroyed them. You were done in. Mephiston tricked you. So you now are going to be sent up into the ceiling, and you're going to sing a song of doom forever. And be tortured forever in Magnus' throne room. <laughs> wah, wah, indeed and so the librarian is now dead 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 not like oh oh he needs the rubicon dead no he's actually dead well it's nice that they um, still snuff it then. and sorry i was hmm? just saying it's nice that someone snuffs it then <laughs> quite so um but they actually reflects on the fact that this device, its name's gone out of my head, this little thing that Mephiston's been doodling on to sketch out the fates and his path the whole time was basically sent by the demon. So the demon's been stringing Mephiston along for so long. And Mephiston seemingly just knew and and walked into it anyway because he had a way out and just schooled this demon seven ways to Sunday. Which is okay, fair enough. More evidence that Mephiston is stupidly, ridiculously overpowered because he also gets his body so body back from Sortiarius somehow um, in order to sort of finish the job. I think his body is maybe brought back by the demon, I guess. Um, it's it's a bit crazy, and I'd have to read it another time just to make sure I've got all the facts straight. But basically, Mephiston is stupid OP. A stupid, stupid, stupid OP. And... Is also setting it is also been set up as either the salvation or the just the annihilation all of the both. blood angels all in one. Yeah, probably both. That's that 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 that's it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's quite a bit unless though. People have, <laughs> unless people have, if you want to ask anything, go right ahead. But that was broadly City of Light. No, no, that's fair enough. Nice synopsis. Thank you very much, sir. That's another one I don't need to watch yet. Um. I, I still think it's... I, I haven't actually read the uh, the first Mephiston book. I've read Revenant Crusade and City of Light. I never got a chance to read the first one, um, which probably set up a lot of things that they paid off in City of Light that I didn't notice. Um, but yeah. between Revenant Crusade and City of Light, they were books I wanted to read for a long time, and they are really good. I'm not actually that up on Darius Inc.'s work, aside from the Mephiston books. I know he does... Is it Blackstone? He writes the Blackstone novel, doesn't he? He did, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not as up on his work, but it's really good. Um, certainly, if you've got a, a character as powerful as Mephiston, it helps. Um, but now I definitely want to go and find and read Darkness in the Blood. Um, because... Good luck. So I think it's only in the limited edition that's out at the moment. So Yeah, which is not great. Uh, but eventually I'd like to get my hands on it so that I can sort of 
try and take what I now know of the Mephiston novels and from the Dante novel and Devastation of Baal and see how much they cross over with the darkness in the blood presumably being Mephiston himself. But yeah, that, that was that. Fair enough. How about you, Bourne? What about you, Bourne? Have you read anything? Uh, strangely enough, I'm all the way back to Horus Rising, a master of man. Um, <laughs> it's it's a bit strange going back to Horus Rising, but I'm really enjoying it. Is it the uh, physics textbook version? No, 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 no. <laughs> this is the been through the bath about five times just where I do all my reading um, version. Honestly, it's wrinklier than I am, which is saying something. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely little thing. But something I, I'd never really thought about before. Uh, you know, the other emperor, the one who gets killed, as one does, because otherwise they can't say, yes. I was there today. Horus slew the emperor. He does state all of the way through, well, in that small ele- element, that he, he not, not his line, he um, saw that, that, that small area through the entirety of the Age of Strife. I was going to ask Rem, actually, you know bloody everything. And thank you very much for all of your sights, sir. Um, but have, have we ever actually mentioned him being a, um, you know, perpetual? I don't think it's ever been mentioned as far as I'm aware. Mm. I just found um, it really weird uh, when I read it again. I was like, yeah. wait a second. He's not talking like, you know, my genetic line, my, my forebears or anything else. I, I have seen everything through uh you know this this people these people through this entire period so i just thought i'd chuck that question boss i need to i need to double check that actually because that, that's so, so much i've actually probably missed it's probably something you, know, you, you just really just don't pay any attention to it at that point in time and you're like hang well, on a minute yeah, that's well, that, that, that's years. it. I mean, I, 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 I can't tell you how many times I've started reading Horus Rising, how many times I've finished it. Not quite the same, obviously. But um, it was the very, very first time I went, wait a minute. So, <laughs> yeah. So is just to, just to remind me and remind the audience, is the leader in Horus Rising just supposed to be a bloke? Are they just a bloke? It's the first of the Horus Heresy books, and obviously it's concerning H- Horus. But I mean, is this emperor that you're referring to the one who's seen them through old night? Is he just a oh right? Bloke? Well, it doesn't say he is the emperor of an advanced, and he human believes himself to be the emperor of mankind. And he does of the Imperium. Uh, you know, not no, mm. and, and he said that. He, he Didn't has it? seen that this 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 area through that period, through all of the way through old, all old night and the age of strife, I have protected it so others can come back and return to the bosom. So I just thought that was a bit strange myself, and again, it's the first time I've mm. ever noticed so that. I went, wait a possible minute. Possible theories there. Um, so just yeah. before we can really just initial theories, one. Exceptionally advanced medical technology, allowing a person to live theoretically forever. Not in, I, uh, human life can be very much prolonged in the 40k universe, but 5k is probably pushing it. Second, he's talking bollocks. <coughs> second, yeah, talking yes. rubbish. Yeah, the bollocks uh, factor. Yep, yeah, I could absolutely be talking rubbish. Third is some form of not actually human. Oh, I was, I was going to yep. say maybe it's like you know. It's like probably like one of those things where, like, whenever the quote emperor dies, his successor takes his place and identity, but just believes he is himself, and no one outside of him knows that the emperor has been replaced, kind of thing. Could be. Um, I had a sort of a Mortarian's dad situation in my head of a being from another world ruling over quietly. Almost. Yeah, psychic vampire, though, being able to transfer over his sentience, as Rem said, would make complete sense. Um, but again, I've been completely thrown off because I haven't actually got, uh, or was it Saturnine? Um, but I have heard many, many a rumour on, on what it contains and how things change. So uh, I was going to do a huge run on the Emperor, thinking, well, they won't change that now. Uh, um, I mean, uh, you can always you know, add a thing about the Emperor's, um, well, one, of, one of his previous names, at the very least. Yeah, um, there are several episodes of the podcast that contain spoilers. Yeah, 
Oh no, I've uh, no, I've I've thrown the entire thing out. I, I have taken the entire yeah, notes. But, and but just everyone and else who is not who we're um, trying to sort of not spoil yeah. it, so we don't have to put more spoiler tags. There is an entire like section of several episodes of podcast where we talk about Saturnite. So if you want to know what we're on about, you can oh, check you have. those. Ah, I'll go. And, yeah, yeah, I will go and check that out instead. My mistake. No, it's fine. Um, we do t- we do try and label spoilers when they come up, but. Just for the sake of not having to do it here, it makes sense not to repeat ourselves when we've already said it. I mean, so, so I say that book has given me, you know, a couple of ideas for future topics. Though I'm I'm not actually going to work on them until the actual book itself is at mass market release. You know, out of the cur- out of courtesy, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that it is might nice. even be worth. I can't, I can't. For, well, for, yeah, I can't get a copy yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. For, so, so, for something as a major, because <laughs> it it does delve into a very major spoiler. Like, if it's like. If it's in regards to books that are out of limited edition release, but not mass market release, and it's something very, very minor, I will add them, but put like a little demo saying minor spoiler. Because mm. obviously, if it's not something that's affecting to the plot, if it's just like a bit of information saying, like, hey, Abaddon had a, had a dad, you know, that's not really a major spoiler, even though it is mentioned in the novel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a spoiler, but it's not no. really groundbreaking. No. It, it's so one of it's like, huh. I mean, it's not like a turn around and said, like... You're not you know, spoiling much. Like, yeah. Rogel Dawn punch Vulcan in the face with a cream pie or something. I don't know, you know, kind of thing. That'd be kind of a huge spoiler type thing. And end up saying <laughs> yeah. Malkador on fire because, you know, Vulcan can't cook. I don't know. Um. <laughs> Fair enough. Malkador yeah. just sitting there in his robes going, this is fine. Hmm. To be fair, I probably wouldn't even mention this stuff until the siege is over because... Obviously, each book has been dropping bombshell after bombshell after bombshell after bombshell. It's probably worth waiting until they're all done before oh, no. you really speak on much siege topics. Exactly. I mean, I've I've told everyone who said, "Oh, can you do a prime arc?" and I said, "No, no, I can't uh, because I'm going to wait a good six months to let things yeah. calm well, down, in, in, settle in, in, in down, finish, and then I'll in, read." In finish, you, you can do Ferris Manners because he's long dead. <laughs> <laughs> First manners, silver arms, lovely guy. Dead. Catches last cannon beams and crushes them and eats sand. The problem is you've now out <laughs> that with Gillum breathing in space. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, don't, 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 just don't. Um, I'm Gillum and I can breathe in space. Punches yes. Corfaron in the face. <laughs> yeah, of of course you can, Robert. You can do anything if you believe. Because I have something before. that you do not have, Corferon. Plot armor! As I've said several times before, <laughs> Primarch's doing stupidly <laughs> overpowered <laughs> nonsense is just par for the course. It is, hey. it is. And why not? It's also exceptionally lazy, which is par for the course, but what the heck? Um, the, yeah, there's an element of lazy like writing. Like, I understand wanting to make these demigods of war... An element! <laughs> an element! Like, I understand wanting to make these demigods of war so utterly ridiculous that they make every space marine look like a jobber. I get it, but there is a line. No, there isn't. <laughs> We've seen there is no line! <laughs> I mean, okay. let, 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 let's, let's take into account some of, some of the absolute ridiculousness of Primarch abilities. Lorgar survives being shot point-blank in the face with a volcano cannon. Angron survives yeah. getting stepped on by a titan. Gilliman can breathe in space. Ferris Mouse <laughs> can catch Laz cannon beams and crush them. Yeah, space doesn't seem so bad. And eat yeah. sand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sanguinius can fly without having a three metre long keel to anchor his wing muscles <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually pointed in the book itself saying hey if he was a biological creature he should have a three metre long keel bone yeah he should yeah. <laughs> yeah. the Primarchs are Cor- Cor- Corvus Korat can turn into an entire flock of ravens and turn invisible yes well, he's magic now <laughs> he's made entirely of candy floss and licorice <laughs> Yeah, and Lionel Johnson can literally sleep through anything. <laughs> Which I, I really envy him that power. I've got to admit. Um, yeah, in essence, the Primarchs are OP and oh, kind and, of and, all have the deal with it. Me and, and and not only that, but Rogal Dawn is dead, alive, missing, <laughs> and have been found all at the same time in the same book within the span of two fucking pages. <laughs> Shrouding his Primark. Shrouding his Primark. There's Rogel Dorn. <laughs> Schrodinger and all of his discredited friends who had the same idea at the same time. Yeah. Um, 
Oh yeah. dear. In essence, the Primarchs have all got the deal with it meme. They've all got the little black sunglasses. Deal with it. They are oh. that OP. Oh, and Fulgrim had sex with a fat version of himself as well. Wait, wait, so, wait a minute. Do what? When, when did this uh, yeah, happen? In, in, I, the, I... in the novel um, Slaves to Darkness. All right, yeah. When Lorga goes to recruit Fulgrim for the final siege on Terra, they have to go to Fulgrim's pleasure yeah. planet, and they're basically yeah. like... It's like Fulgrim and Fatgrim, as we like to call him, who's actually Nakari in disguise, no. dressed up as... Cosplaying as an obese Fulgrim for some godforsaken reason. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, and then Fulcrum was um, calling him his beloved and stuff like that, and they're all like describing how it be like writhing together and all that. Stop talking, please. Mm. I know this episode is getting demonetized. I, I've accepted that, but good <laughs> grief. Oh, wow. And then I've we got Ian Watson. And here he goes. <laughs> uh, it's fine, it's fine. I've got, and to be fair, oh, it's dear. fine. It's it's no big deal. Uh, but yes. Primarch's OP, that is the message of the day. Right, where are we for time? Because, oh, blind, we've gone for an hour 40 and we haven't even got to questions. Oh, dear. <laughs> we do this a lot, don't we? We just start talking and don't stop. Well, it's, I'm new here. It's not my fault. No, it, it's completely it's completely ours. Um, <laughs> and fair, it's, it's almost better sometimes to do the discussions that way because you just you don't feel like you're constraining yourself. Okay, we've had 10 minutes on this. We have to move on. It's I much prefer these sort of long, free-flowing shows that just go wherever they want. I do like them. To be honest, I remember we did some shows that used to run to like 2 hours 30, I think, is our record. Um, um, I think yeah. between us, me and Rem just like, no, we need to eat. We need to stop recording so we can eat. Uh, that's pretty much the only reason the podcast doesn't go on twice as long. It's because we're hungry. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> but yes, shall we get a few questions in before we close out? Uh, yeah, let me just bring them up quickly. Da, da, da. Um, with the Necrons getting a range refresh, which of the Xenos or Chaos Rays do you feel deserves a similar refresh? Not mentioning the Imperium because they get new models every few weeks. Neds. Mm. Neds, are you insane? Those are gorgeous models, Eldar. Oh yeah, Crap Worlds is a good shout. I think the reason I say Nids is like things like Gaunts, the Khan effects get they're gorgeous, but the they, I don't know. I, I think there's certain models uh, in that range that do need an upgrade. Corn Berserkers, they need redoing yeah, but they completely. They are plastic. Yeah, but, but they are Xenos. They are Xenos and Chaos. Should I say oh, again. Chaos. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I, I'm gonna go Corn Berserkers because it's still the, the third edition models. Yeah, they, 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 it's not good. It's, it's not a yeah, good I look. I think, yeah, for a full range reboot, Craft Worlds actually might be better. Uh, Nids is my impulse response because I feel like Gaunts could do with an upgrade uh, in particular. Uh, um, but they're plastic. Um, you know, they are modern. They're within the modern line. Also new um, So that, that really needs it. Yeah, oh, right. A Biovore would be good. Yeah, Biovore would be good. Yeah. Yeah, so we just get rid of the the fine cast, the fail cast. Yeah. Just get rid of that. But when it really comes down to it, the Eldar range, if you actually look at a lot of those models, I mean, like the Aspect Warriors, etc. And we know they're coming. They've done one. We know they're going to have the rest coming out. We know that. We're going to drip feed them to us. Yeah, I think Crap World is um, fair because yeah, Jakari got a full reboot Sorry. in fifth. Uh, I know orcs. they're gorgeous, so I've got loads. <laughs> yeah. Orcs have been steadily re updated. Yeah. Some of the models are still quite old. Like the Orc Boys kit is actually getting on a bit, but it works just fine. Um, yeah. As someone who plays Tau, I'd love new Vespid miniatures, but I'm biased. Yeah. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of Crew, but I don't know. They're fine. And most of the Tau range has been redone to this point, aside from like the Hammerhead. So I think I'm quite all right with Tau staying as they are. Uh, fair enough. Some more Scooby Doo's would be nice, though. That's what I call Croot. Um, Why Scooby Doo's? Hmm. Oh, oh! I shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, nothing I can say online. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, they remind they remind me of dogs. Uh, they we'll they literally have like Croot hounds, uh, which are like bird dogs. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> right. Um, aside from the Horus Heresy, what is your favourite Black Library series? Oof. Oof. That's hard. Um, I mean, I, I'm exceptionally biased, but I love the Farsight novels. I've enjoyed the Mephiston books greatly recently. Um, the Macaria series was good. 
I'm going for the Night Lord series. You know, big shock. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, that, that somehow doesn't shock me that much. Uh, but then me saying Tau shouldn't shock anyone either, so... <laughs> Uh, but probably in terms of a series that's complete that I've read from first book to last, probably Macarius is the is the main one I've finished. Huh? What about you, Baltimore? Uh, I don't really. Have no. I cut out? No, no, no. You're still there. Have, have I? Okay. <laughs> no. I always find these questions rather depressing. It's like a Sophie's Choice scenario. Um, I don't want to upset them. So, yeah, I can always see my face if on that one. I just haven't read... The problem, I think, is I haven't finished that many seasons or runs. Um, I've kind of done one or two, then kind of put them down. I'm, I kind of don't like finishing them immediately and saying to myself, when I retire, I shall finish them all. And um, it's like I prefer... TV series over videos or you know, over films because I don't like the ending. Um, so <laughs> I started loads, finished very few, and uh, that's probably a psychological issue nobody needs to know about. Yeah. Not not many, Reb. Sorry. Right. Da -da -da. Who does the Dark Mechanicus worship? The Omnissiah, the Chaos Gods, or both? Um, I think it's. Both? If I if I remember correctly, I think they view um, the Omnisite as being like an aspect of Chaos Undivided or something. Yeah, or something to that know, effect. I know the big kickoff was about the Emperor not being the Omnisire. That was one of the big reasons for the Dark Mechanicum split. Well, one of. One of the many. But that was one of the first ones. Well. Was, yeah, one of yeah. the excuses, so, yeah. They obviously still cared about the Omnissiah as a concept, as the Dark Mechanicum. That's not to say that they haven't supplanted it with, oh, we can just stick demons in things now. We don't need the Omnissiah. Mm. So I'm not sure. Fair enough. Actually, I could probably check that. No, There's I'm a book way. by... Oh, his name's going out of my head. There's a two-part book called Adeptus Mechanicus that I've got. I want to say it's by Rob Sanders or Andy Clark, and I can't remember. Um, it's got two books in it. It's Guitari and, and um, something else. And it deals with an assault upon a Dark Mechanic and Forge world. Um, so I might check. I might be able to find it in there. If someone has that and can check, you might be able to find it. I don't know. Fair enough. Right. Um, who's better equipped to fight the Nids, Orcs or Necrons? Orcs. Yeah, I'm going to have to go for the Orcs as well, just because they've got sheer numbers on their size. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the only caveat that's, with the Orcs is every time the Orcs die, it's more fuel for the Tyranids, whereas the Necrons have less numbers, but have better range, better equipment for avoiding them, and also don't actually help them when they die the same, because... Digesting living metal is not really a thing they do. It's. I think the orcs would probably be in a long war. You'd rather have the orcs than the necrons for a single fight. I'd rather have the necrons to beat them and the orcs to pin them. I see what you mean. Um, I just personally believe that orcs. Well, no matter what happens, comes out of Octarius. I think the orcs generally are going to be a lot more effective against the two. It's just no one's going to back them up. Of course, the best way to actually. <laughs> make them anti tyranny is to attack them as much as possible. So, I mean, if everyone wants to help out, they should be attacking orcs as much as they can. Get that orky power up. Get the war energy going. And then basically pull an Eldari and point them at what you want them to hit. Because that's basically what um, yeah. the Eldari did with... Uh, well, so, so it's told is that they pointed... Uh, the orchestrated events to point while Gazkul and Armageddon to avoid some craft worlds or maiden worlds. Well, they redirected him. Yes. Uh, he was going in that direction anyway, but they just shifted him. Well, they moved him into the position of being in charge, didn't they? Something like that. I forget so, the exact uh, details some, of how that story else. goes. Um, 
Well, it was uh, there, were, there was an orc warlord who was in charge, and if he'd stayed in charge, he would have attacked uh, Ulthway. And if he didn't stay in charge, if basically Gaskell had taken command, then he would have taken the same orcs to Armageddon, as far as I can recall. Yeah, that uh, sounds Armageddon. right. That sounds right. Um, and Crippman took... Oh, I'm right. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And Crippman took a very similar attack with Octarius. Like, he redirected the Tyranids at Octarius. Uh, might backfire, but... <laughs> might. <laughs> <laughs> might. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's definitely going to backfire. Yeah, it, the amount it will backfire <laughs> will depend on who wins, because if the Tyranids win, infinite biomass. If the Orcs win, stupid, chunky mega-Orcs. Yeah, possibly Crook. Um... I don't even know... I don't even know... I, Croak wise, that like, was the beast even on Croak. Oh, he probably was Croak level. Uh, no, but no. Sorry, mate. I don't think so. Um, getting there, but I don't think it was actually Croak level. But of course, Remleys would. Know. I mean, considering that the beast was close to the size of like an imperial knight, huh. like the fact he was using like a Lehman Rust turret as a club. Hmm. He was no, a bit, I don't they, think when they walked into the beast throne room, they thought he was a statue. Yeah, but if he were a proper, true leader of Crook, you know, a Crook Alpha, whatever you want to call it, but let's call it a war boss who is a Crook, then he would have stimulated all of the orcs to not just be large orcs, they would become Crook too. So he, although he may be a low level, I mean, you know, proto Crook, if you will. Works. It, that's just in, my, in fairness, my, my a lot perspective. Of the orcs of the Beast Hordes were actually described as being a hell of a lot larger than normal orcs. Like a lot of the orc boys were described as being war boss size, just for the normal orc boys. So if you got yeah, absolutely, but what I'm saying is, is if they were crook, then the smallest of them would be the size of the beast. Fair point. Quite possibly, yes. It's only an opinion, then. Yeah, we, we've never really had a true sense of scale for the crocs because we've only ever heard about them in word we've never seen them in image yeah okay um why do the drukari have to kidnap all the cool characters in 40k because otherwise no one else will read about them it's like a crossover and probably because we're having all the fun with the cool characters so they want to have all the fun in the arenas for themselves I mean, I mean, someone replied saying because they don't have any cool characters of their own. Uh, that's, well, in rules, maybe. Uh-huh. In law, oh my god, their characters are awesome. Yeah, well, they took a load of our characters out at the end of Fifth, didn't they? What I'm not moaning about. Yeah, Sliscus, Saphonix, Malice, Vect. I think, actually, I think maybe, maybe not in Ninth, maybe, hopefully in Ninth, I think we're going to see Vect back, I hope. Yeah, it... it now that they prove they can do super mega character with Cesarek, I think we might get a Vect back. Yeah. Like full on Dark Muse Vect. I think we've all been saying that. But um, I, again, I, I think there's no hope worse than false hope. I don't think I'm going to get my Vecty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, would, I, would um, I sort of see it as we've got two types of hope Bob Hope and No mm. Hope. Mm. But <laughs> I'd rather. It would be cool to see. Yeah. Oh, no, it would be absolutely magnificent. They've got the skill, they've got the talent. Do they have the interest? That's the question. We'll see how the Silent King sells, I guess. Hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, God, why does Blue Internet have to be so slow? <laughs> so it's taking a while to load up. All right. Welcome to my <laughs> world every day. 16 hours to upload a lesson video. Oof. Why are so many factions in the Imperium, such as the Mechanicus, Inquisition, Dark Angels, Emma Stratum, and several Space Marine chapters, concerned about the power and influence of Ultramar? Um, it will depend on the faction as to why they have problems with the Ultramarines. Um, I think one of the main problems, one of the main reasons they have a problem is because, like, hey, uh, their Primarch's just turned up and now he's pretty much running the Imperium and there might be some nepotism going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cer- certainly no, really? the High Lords have concerns about Gilliman <laughs> being a, a dictator. Because he was for a bit and then I think he gave the High Lords the Imperium back. Yeah, he, didn't he abolish the Senatorum for a bit? He appointed... 
he appointed um, new High Lords, from what I recall. Like, he got rid of most of the High Lords and replaced them with new ones. Yeah, that's not exactly uh, diplomatic. Uh, certainly, I, I know that some have issues with Gilliman because of, of the Ultramarines because of the Primaris. Um, like Gabriel Seth summed it up best of turning all Space Marines into just different colours of Ultramarines. Yes. I know that that's a legitimate concern that some have. Um, the Dark Angels don't have a problem with the Ultramarines. They have a problem with Gilliman because what if he learns about the secrets? Oh, no. And yet, as we all know, um, you can say that he was standing right next to Sofa. <laughs> yes. Yes, he was. So, you know, saying, ah, he might find out that there are naughty... Wait a minute. <laughs> that Cypher over there. It's, it's you know, yeah. something... Does Azrael I, I know, know they that. like their memes. Oh, God. I mean, it happened in the Gathering Storm and Azrael was on the far side. I don't know if he even knew that Cypher had met Gilliman. Okay, yeah, if you take that for a few, that's fair enough. I think personally it would have gone I'm out. willing to be wrong. I'm just curious. Did Azrael know? No, I wouldn't know. I'm not Azrael. Bad man that he is. <laughs> J- joke, 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 joke. I hate this new... I hate, I hate this oh new way that YouTube sets out its fucking page. I hate the new layout. It's fucking terrible. I've sort of got used to it. Like yeah. I've got uh, a rubbish... Up- I've got a half go key download speed for loading stuff, but my upload speed is garbage. So I sort of sympathise... Uh, with yeah. the loading times, I sort of got used to the new YouTube systems. It's it's it's. Do I prefer the old one? Yes. I, can I make the new one work? Also, yes. <laughs> it's it's not the best, but it's what it is. How much time have we got left? We got time for one more, if it loads. Uh, yeah, I think if it's as long as we're not going to be here for twenty minutes deciding it, then yeah, I think we'll be good for one more. Right. Okay. For bloody mm. loads. Mm. Right. Uh, do you think it's possible for the Eldaria Necrons to get over their old rivalry, at least temporarily, due to Chaos and the Nids? I know the novel Wild Rider had a hint of it. Um. Yeah, yeah, but the novel Wild Rider had had El, had the Eldari and pre-Necron Necron tier fighting against demons of Slaanesh before, before the events of the War in Heaven. It was a cluster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wild Rider was... Yeah. Interesting, but also timeline-wise, a bit of a mess. Um, to so, put it mildly, it's just a clear indication of how they really, really need an editor in chief to be uh, one person and to read what they're putting out. Quite possibly, um, they could have done a hell of a Siege of Terror series. Oh, that, <laughs> as oh, for that was a bit Eldari sorry. Necron yeah. Alliance to deal with the Tyranids, <laughs> I wouldn't. I play for a Baltan. No. I'd rather... I'd, no. I mean, the Eldari are not exactly known for not being petty <coughs> about things. They were genetically... Yeah, but they were genetically engineered on a spiritual level to a certain extent as well to uh, hate Necrons on sight. They are not just antipathy towards each other, they're anathema. I can't see the Eldar yeah. ever getting over it. And the Necrons, if you actually look at their MO, most of the time they're, all right, yeah, yeah, they're, we've gone through different permutations, etc. But as far as I know, and I could be wrong, as always, um, but yeah, have you noticed that they, they will kill orcs and uh, Eldar, you know, as children, direct children of the old ones, with a lot more verve and, verve and vigour than they ever do. Certainly the, the Necrons have always had a, le- well, actually the Necron tier's entire MO was let's kill everything in the galaxy. And the Necrons were not much better. Well, the, thing the, ne- the Necrons MO was based depending on the edition, because like in third edition, it's like, <laughs> hey, true. we're, we're, we're going to start a war of you because you're not going to give us secrets to immortality because you could just let us stay yeah. here on this one world where we're being cooked to death by our own son. St- still the same. And the old one's like, nah, fam, we're good. It's still the same according to the Codex, though. Um, it's <laughs> Yeah, Necron motivations vary greatly, but generally they are very, very efficient at murdering squishy, fleshy meat bags. They're very good they at are. it. It's still a convoluted yeah, mess, true. though, considering, especially mm. with 8th edition, basically seeming to be a com- an, an amalgamation of all the yeah. previous editions, even if it doesn't bloody yeah. work. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's but not on the other hand, you, uh, It's like you're using 3rd edition law to describe something from 5th edition in a 7th edition context where it just doesn't bloody work. <laughs> <laughs> quite so, quite so. 
And to be fair, as much as the Silent King might absolutely want the Tyranids dead, bear in mind the Necrons are machines. They are coded. They may have personalities, but they have protocols. They have codes. They have presumably directives. And one of them is probably everything that is done with the old ones, go and smash it under all circumstances. As you may have hinted at earlier with the Verve and Vigor comments, you're probably right. I haven't noticed it myself, but you're probably uh, right. Hey, hey. Remember when that issue of White Dwarf suggested that the Silent King created the nids? Oh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't. I still get people doing that on the comments section. I'm like, oh, come on, lads. Come on, give that one up, please. Just just <laughs> let it go to dead, bed. No, <laughs> just bloody no. It, it's a, it, even if I don't agree with it canonically, it's a great... It's, it's such a classic story of the creator being turned on by and having to destroy their creations because they went too far. It's classic. So basically Frankenstein. It's classic, it's tragic, it's also utterly ridiculous and would suit... No one. Not at all, probably, the Silent King. Um, but it, It's classic, it's tragic, it's completely batshit insane, it makes no sense in the context of the law, therefore it's perfect for 40k. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well played. <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> and on that bombshell, I think, uh, I think we'll call time there. Um, so that has been episode ninety-eight of Adeptus Podcasters. Thank you very much to Baldemar for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much for the honour of speaking with both of you, and I mean that at uh, uh, a high point. Thank you very, very much. Well, that's very, very kind of you to say. I, I, I know exactly how you feel because when we started this show, I had fifteen hundred subs, and Rem was already a juggernaut of the industry. So I know. I was how hardly you a, feel. I was hardly a juggernaut. I only had like uh, like thirty thousand subs at that point. I think. Yeah, that was twenty times my sub. Yeah, I was yeah. no one. Uh, again, you're <laughs> referring to numbers. I'm referring to the fact that I've been listening to Remleys for years. And um, as I say, it's a voice that helped me through a very, very difficult time in my life. So thank you. Oh, I'm glad that could be a help. And uh, both of you are architects of this entire genre. If you look at your time date stamps and what you've done. So it is. Uh, I'm an certainly honor. not the first Lord Tuba. I, there's, there's people who've been around longer than I have. Some people are still doing it. Granted, one of the guests that I'd love I'd loved to have had if they were still uploading would be Vaults of Terror. But they. What has happened to him? Really I don't know actually what happened to Vaults of Terror, uh, but they no, stopped uploading. No one um, And but them and others were some of the bigger people when I got started. I'm certainly no architect. Maybe maybe I changed the format. Maybe I did something unique that made people care. Or maybe I wrote on the fact that I had a podcast with Remleys and thus everyone came and watched my stuff. It, who knows? But certainly I don't feel like I deserve any of that reverence that you seem to have for I for. For either of us, certainly for Rem, I get it. Oh. For me, I don't. <laughs> well, it's a good job. It's my perspective, and not yours, then, sir. Touche, touche. Right. Anyway, that is the end of the episode. Next time is episode ninety-nine, and then next time we're back on Tactica Imperialis. Oh, for the, for the carnage, the for it's... the Ian Watson appreciation special. Oh, it's going to be absolute bananas. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I mean, h- h- how many guests have we got lined up? Uh... About 20? Uh, the server for the show has a, is 20 people, though one of those is two people, so it's actually 21. Right. Ah, so the Primark number. Well done. How poetic. Ah. We need to appoint everyone a legion at this point. <laughs> yeah, good luck trying to get the Night Lords off. I, I, we got, um... I, I, I call Night Lords. Ah, you, good luck getting that one. No, that means two... <laughs> Yeah, it means two of them will drop out. I, 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 well, I'm just going to say, like, you know, you know, yes, Dissimona, she can have the word bears because she likes them as well. So she, she can have them. Uh, who do I, I've got a shock. Oh, God. How am I going to get the Thousand Sons off Scarlet? Uh, with a fist fight. <laughs> with great difficulty is the answer to that question. Anyway, that is all to come in four weeks' time. <laughs> and I hope you look forward uh, Mike, to that. Mike, Michael, Michael, you should really ask how you're going to get the Thousand Sons off of Zegra. I mean, here's Magnus. 
Good point. I didn't want to give too much away. That was all. That's all but I yes. want to give. <laughs> yeah. So look forward to that on the channel in four weeks' time. And in two weeks, we've got the, the calm before the storm um, with Rem and I. We're going to have episode 99. Look forward to that. And I hope to see you there. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. This has been Tactical Imperialis. This has been Rem Lays from 40K Theories. Oh, and uh, Baldemort from Baldemort's guys. And we'll see you all next time. Goodbye.